Good evening, and welcome back to the Untold Tales of Drakenheim. This is the Dungeon Dudes Weekly Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Livestream Campaign. My name is Monty Martin, running our campaign as Dungeon Master, and we are joined by some of my good friends and a very special guest this evening. Uh, I'm Kelly McLaughlin, one of the good friends, not the very special guest. I'm here almost every week. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm going to be playing today, and I'm very excited. And I'm Joe Gorman, also not our friendly special guest. Who is but drumroll? It, <laughs> but it is my pleasure to introduce our amazing guest this evening, author Matt Ruff. Matt, yes. for those who have uh, are not familiar with with uh, your work, uh, tell our uh, audience about what you do. So yes, I'm Matt Ruff. I'm the author of seven novels. Uh, most recently, uh, Eighty Eight Names and Lovecraft Country, which was made into an HBO series recently, and. Uh, and 88 Names is out in paperback now, and uh, that that's the one that may be of most interest to your listeners. It's uh, a near-future story about a guy who works as an online guide to uh, role-playing games, playing in VR, and uh, he gets a new client who he comes to suspect may actually be Kim Jong-un, who's interested in VR role-playing for nefarious reasons. So it's, uh, it's this weird but fun uh, cat and mouse game set largely in virtual reality where everyone has control over how they look and sound and you're constantly guessing who's who and what they're up to. So, um, and uh, as far as uh, D and D, by the way, this is, as Monty may have mentioned before in an earlier episode, um, this will be my first time playing D and D in 35 years. The last time I think I did a, a Ravenloft campaign in college. So, um, I'm I'm very glad to have these two guys guiding me through this and um and uh yeah this is going to be a lot of fun though. Yeah, we're so excited. It is an honor to be able to play with you. We're such fans of your work and the uh and really looking forward to uh getting you back in the game tonight. Uh we have brewed up a really wonderful scenario thanks to all your amazing creativity and we are so excited to play this. Um, as uh, as all of you following along may or may not know, these are our untold tales of Drakenheim. Um, our one of our regulars on our show, Jill Denitis, has recently had a her first baby, and so Yay. she's been taking a couple months off to recuperate uh, and get a new baby all settled in. And so we've taken this opportunity to uh, play with some amazing guests, including Matt. This is actually the last of our untold tales before we come back with Shadows of Drakenheim uh, uh, in April. So we'll be playing this week this week and next with Matt and then taking a week off for Easter and then back in with Shadows of Drakenheim. These Untold Tales have been amazing for Kelly and I because, as you may or may not know, we are putting out a book as well. Uh, Dungeons of Drakenheim is coming to life as a 5th edition module on Kickstarter this June. Uh, and so we've been using the Untold Tales as an opportunity to playtest some of the potential new locations which will be expanding the city of Drakenheim and the original campaign so that you can play that yourself. So if you're interested in uh, checking out our book, you can head up uh, Drakenheim drakenheim.com to sign up for the mailing list there and otherwise we are going to dive in and try out this new adventure that we uh along with uh some of these fantastic characters so with that shall we delve into the ruins sure absolutely, absolutely. awesome so a news has hit the word uh, new news has fallen upon the ears and lips of those in the know regarding rare and valuable artifacts lost in the cursed city of Drakenheim. There are countless valuables that have been lost in this meteor racked city, but one recently word of one has turned the ears of several factions and heroes within the city. The Scepter of St. Vitruvio, a powerful artifact of the patron saint of Drakenheim himself, said to have miraculous healing powers. Long thought lost in an unknown vault, rumor has it that the scepter has been actually in a small and humble chapel devoted to the faith of the sacred fire, 
on the very outskirts of the city, no less. With these wild rumors flying around, three unlikely partners <laughs> have gathered together to stake the claim on this valuable scepter before anyone else can gain it. They had been brought together by one curious fellow. Matt, do you want to tell us who you're playing tonight? So, um, you know, people in my line of work uh, generally do not like witnesses, but um, for those of you who are watching, uh, I am uh, Alvin Peasblossom, uh, a.k.a. Mr. Big, a mastermind level rogue of the uh, a gnome persuasion. Um, most people know me from my best-selling self-published memoir, Art of the Steel. Uh, and in my career, I have headed numerous illustrious criminal organizations and uh, planned and executed some truly amazing heists. Um, you know, too many to count, really. Uh, and I would uh, long since have retired a wealthy gnome, uh, if not for the incompetence and, you know, frankly, jealousy of uh, some of my henchmen. Um, this last year has been particularly difficult. Um, I started out leading a group uh, called Alvin's Eleven. Um, you know, that's right, the Alvin's Eleven. I'm sure you've heard of us. Um, after the other 10 ended up in prison, uh, I formed the, uh, the Wolves of Wall Street, um, which was a truly next level idea to employ uh, lycanthrops in bank robbery. Um, <laughs> We hit the uh, Argent Reserve Bank, and um, as I predicted, uh, werewolves are really good at scaling walls and overpowering guards. Um, it turns out they're not so good at uh, carrying silver bullion. <laughs> you know, really, folks, what kind of a loser bank doesn't have gold? This is this is why the economy is bad because. I, I don't even want to talk about it. Um, anyway, um, my most recent exploit was a, a truly daring attempt to uh, rob the aerial currency transport, uh, AKA the money blimp. Um, this plan was 95% successful. Uh, we got on board, uh, we got control, uh, we made it to the fortified storage compartment, which, um, and I, I had triple checked this this time, did have gold inside. Um, in the process of trying to crack the storage compartment open, there was a mishap, um, basically a misunderstanding about the meaning of the word inflammable. Uh, and, you know, we had to abort. Um, I got out. Uh, most of the other guys didn't. And uh, my second in command, uh, Bart Littlesworth, uh, ended up going down with the blimp. And um, he survived with some disfigurement. Um, and yet, look, I'm going to be brutally honest here. Uh, Littlesworth was never a good-looking guy, you know. I'm not, I'm not saying third-degree burns are an improvement, um, but you know, I, I do feel like he's maybe exaggerating his suffering a little bit. Um, and he's been bad mouthing me to the uh, the thieves' guild, spreading all kinds of lies. Um, for example, uh, he claims I stole his parachute. Um, first of all, not true. Um, but second of all, let's say for the sake of argument, it was true. Uh, who sounds like the better thief? A guy who steals a parachute, escapes a burning blimp unscathed, you know, handsome as ever. Uh, or a guy who lets his parachute be stolen and ends up looking like an overdone brisket. I mean, am I right or am I right? You're right, um, boss. You're right, boss. You're right. It's great. Like 95%, boss. Yeah. Who's this other this other guy? I don't know. This yeah, other. I don't even know him. I don't even know him. So, yeah. So, long story short, um, you know, Mr. Loser Bart Littlesworth, uh, you know, is a is a, a, a jealous nincompoop who has been using lies to turn other members of the profession against me. Um, he's been, you know... I, I understand he's got some family contacts in the Thieves Guild, so, you know, nepotism, which is a cancer. Uh, and uh, anyway, that's uh, that's how I ended up working with these two geniuses. Um, well said, but, boss. 
you know, it's okay. They speak common. They, they know how to take orders and they can carry things, which is, is really all I need besides my giant brain. And uh, today, as you've heard, we're going after the uh, famed healing staff of St. Uh, Vitruvio, um, which I am reliably told is worth 5,000 gold pieces. And, you know, uh, given my incredible bargaining skills, I, I think we can easily double that. Um, so, you know, I'm going to be back on top in no time. And uh, Littlesworth, if you're listening, I, I mean, you shouldn't be listening, but, you know, but if you are listening, screw you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, as... I'm just imagining this conversation taking place as you are heading towards the ruins of the city. And so your two new henchmen um, nodding along as, as you explain your great ex exploits. The first of the two, Kelly, tell us who you're playing. Uh, so my name's Fred Oates. I've uh, ran into some uh, hard luck. Me and my brother, actually, we, uh, Yo. we, uh, we work together. We have our whole lives. Um, little known fact, I was, I'm the older brother out of the two of us. I was born seven one. minutes, seven minutes and 53 seconds before my brother was. Now, me and my brother, uh, we come from a really nice family down in Toddsfeld. They, uh, they own the dam there, uh, really lucrative business, dam owning, <laughs> didn't, didn't know. Um, but we decided to take our inheritance, our savings, and we decided to make a name for ourselves separate of our parents. So we came to Drakenheim and we decided to open the store that amplified what we were best at. And it was called Fred and Ted's Odds, Ends, and Wheels. We made circular wheels. We made square wheels. We made triangular wheels. The circular wheels were actually the best sellers. Best seller all the time and that's thanks to ted he's the salesman he's he can really pitch a, a round wheel um so we built this shop we we made it right in the south ward of drakenheim put all of our money we got a moving crew they loaded all of our stuff in right after they finished ted what was it you said to me we were walking we looked up in the sky what what was it i said i i says to fred i says this is gotta be the next chapter in in a great in a in a in a great place in history for the Oates family. It was the next step. It was the next step for us. And then uh, we looked up at the sky, and there was a meteor. A meteor out and of nowhere in the middle of the day. Just we started running. It hit our shop. It blew up all of our belongings. Everything. everything. There was magical artifacts in there. There was an amulet that exploded, and parts of it are in me and my brother Ted, and now we have magical powers. We both got a chunk of amulet. And and what's worse, we we tried to make the money back so we could, we lied to our parents and said, everything's fine, the shop's running great. Drakenheim's Drakenheim. fine, it's, everything's so fine good. over here. So good. And uh, then, uh, next thing you know, we hear that the dam blew up. The dam. The parents lost everything. The dam, they, they, they didn't, I don't think they... They reinforced it. it. It was like it was a guy on the inside. I bet probably didn't. We're, oh, man. we're never going to financially recover from this. So here we are trying. We're trying. <laughs> I heard I've, I'm under good knowledge. You know, I got a trusted source that says that this thing is worth. Mr. Big told me five thousand dollars. We could get our hands on a little bit of that. We can repay mom and dad. We can make sure that they're taken care of. This is this is our ticket back back home. Yeah. Save the Oats family. Just save the oats. That's our motto. Save the oats. <laughs> and so, what classes? Uh, what what classes are you all playing uh, th this evening? Your fourth level characters. What it, what uh, class combo is are each of you? Um, uh, Matt, go ahead. No, no. I, okay, I'm a yeah, I'm a rogue arcane trickster. Um, I I you know, but of course I'm I'm technically fourth level, but really far beyond but beyond that. <laughs> Um, oh, I'm, without a doubt. I'm playing a human Psy Warrior fighter. Um, fourth level and probably performing way under that. <laughs> and I'll be playing a human uh, Aberrant Mind Sorcerer. Um, uh, probably right on par. Uh, I, I'd probably say I'm right right on... Uh, With the Goldilocks option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just right. Okay. 
So as the group of you make the lonely road from the last bastion of civilization, the small village known as Emberwood Village, through the contaminated and ruined wasteland surrounding the outskirts of the city towards Drakenheim. You can look up, you can see the ruined city, the per midnight purple clouds billowing overhead. Um, fortunately, no rain today in Drakenheim. That means the mission is a go. <laughs> now, the from what you recall, the Chapel of St. Brenna there has been a lot of confusion over where the scepter of St. Vitruvia was lost. And the word that it is in the Chapel of St. Brenna would have not been helpful were it not for the fact that Fred and Ted had been there when they owned their business in Drakenheim. And so you know that it is not far down the, uh, not far from the city outskirts in the, the lower south ward of the city outside the city walls it's nestled in this bit of a lower class neighborhood um on a small hill in a park surrounded by several residential buildings and so it won't be you won't have to sneak too far into the city ruins before you get there as you head into the city though i will ha like each of you to roll me a six-sided die and tell me the result a three. I also got a three. I got a one. Oh, there he is. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ted. Sorry. Sorry, Fred. Sorry, boss. <laughs> the you make your way through the ruins, getting turned around only three times. The twisting streets shift and Directions are hazy at best, for indeed, the haze, a strange misty fog has settled over the city, its glinting motes of prismatic light almost ma making it difficult to actually see down the city streets even during the day. And so despite getting turned around a few times, um, you're, it, it's only a few hours of traveling through the city streets before you're able to arrive at the familiar city blocks where they break into a small plaza where the chapel of St. Brenna lies. So despite the early turnarounds, you can see that there is, there, you can see the deteriorating chapel and you recognize it because the dome of the chapel rises above the nearby buildings. So as soon as you rec recognize the weather vane on top, you're like, ah, there it is. And you make your way through the twisting streets towards the chapel proper. As I said, it lies atop a small hillock in the middle of a desolate residential burrow with a small park surrounding it. Despite the heavy damage to the surrounding buildings, the slate roof of the dome is mostly intact, but as you round the corner, you can see that it's a circular building overall, except it has two towers flanking the front entrances, both cylinder shaped. One of the tower has completely collapsed into a mound of stone rubble, uh, the pile about 15 feet high whereas the other has partially collapsed, but is still mostly intact on the first and second level. There's piles of debris all around the, 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 the base, and the lower part of the, the chapel had elegant arched stained glass windows, but about half of the mosaics are completely shattered. There's a small terrace with a sundial behind the chapel, and there's a short footpath that veers off as it heads towards the chapel proper, that veers off into this walled garden beside the chapel. And looking over the garden is a statue of an armored woman holding a, a rod in her hands, looking down with a mournful face. Because as, as you know, as is common knowledge, in the faith of the sacred fire to which this chapel is devoted, Cremation is the standard practice. So chapels do not have uh, cemeteries. They have um, plots where funeral pyres would be set up 
for the last rites. But there's one peculiar sight that immediately strikes your eye as you arrive on the site. Tied to a tree beside the crematory garden are five horses, one covered in armored barding. And as you approach, it looks like there is a rather thin person with a shield and a spear and some armor that is tending these five horses. There might just be a flicker of light inside the chapel itself. Someone's got here first. Uh, boss, it looks like somebody's got here first. Boss, they beat us to the punch. Hmm. Well, um, I think I should go up and talk to this person and try and find out what's going on. And I'm going to make it make it sound like I perhaps got lost. Make them think I've just you know sort of wandered onto the scene, and I'm uh, I'm trying to you know find out where I am. So let me let me go up to this person and speak to them. Good Should idea, we? boss. If you uh, if you need any help, if you need any muscle or uh, or uh, Ted, um, let us know. I'll get so, in position. I've just got up the map here, just in case it's is relevant for y'all to consider. So this is the garden um, over here. Um, I've blacked out the chapel because you can't quite see inside it. You can kind of see through the windows that there's a bit of flickering light, and the sundial terrace out the back, and then the front. Uh, past the grass that you can see on this map, uh, it opens up into the a cobblestone city street, and then there are rows of houses surrounding the the area here. So this is a square, a square kind of the the chapel lies in the middle of a square surrounded by townhomes. So, Mister Big, you would like to approach uh, the the tender of the horses. Actually, is there a way that I can that I can see inside the chapel without letting the the person tending the horses see me first? I just want to get an idea of who we're dealing with. Absolutely, you can approach from any direction you wish because you have the advantage of the buildings surrounding the um, the chapel are mostly ruined and in various states of decay. So it's possible to crawl through the buildings and keep yourself out of sight as you circle around if you wish. And if you do want to get closer to try to look through the windows, you certainly can try. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, let me let me try and actually I've got my my familiar uh, Walt the rat. Um, let me let me send in Walt. Walt the mechanical rat, I will uh, I will send in to just go peek in the windows while we hang back out of sight. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, to remind you, you can actually see through your familiar's eyes by concentrating right, on that. which is what I'll do. Yeah. Okay. So, um, as you can see the the, the chapel here, um, my only question for you is, which direction would you like to send your rat looking from? <laughs> Let's go, yeah, like somewhere along here. All right. Sounds good to me. Okay. So I will just reveal the rest of this area for you all. And describe for you what you see. So as you look through the window, you can see that the the this the your rat kind of crawls up the side of the wall and looks through one of the broken windows into the the chapel proper. At the heart of the chapel is a three-tiered stone altar that's set with a large bronze brazier. Standard practice for this religion. There's petrified wood and ashes within, and there's prayer benches and a few bits of rubble and, and debris scattered all, all about. The worshippers of the sacred fire stand in a circle around the altar, and they sing hymns together. Um, there's debris covering the floor, but there seems like there's a painted mosaic that might be underneath. Again usual for these folks and there's three statues of various saints in the alcoves of the uh of this chamber now what strikes you right away is that there are four people in the chapel um all uh, one of them carries a shield in his right hand and he's wearing plate armor and has a sword sheathed at his uh at, at his hilt all of them are wearing symbols of the sacred fire. And the other three are garbed in chainmail, 
and they've set their spears down um, beside the front entrance. And their shields are they're also down. And all of them are going through, looking through the um, the altar boxes and looking around underneath the statues. And you hear the the armored knight. He says to uh, one of the, the 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 women following him, "Keep looking. They must have left the key here somewhere. It, it's it's got to be here. It can't just be lost." Hmm. Uh, hey, boss. Yeah. I, one of the things that's happened to me recently is I found out that I can occasionally become invisible. Again, I've seen it. Yeah, wow. it's it's pretty crazy. I always uh, tap Ted on the shoulder when I'm invisible, and he doesn't know who did it. It's wild. It he falls for it every time. Now, instead of tapping these guys on the shoulder, these guys and girls, they left their spears by the front entrance. Yes, you can see um, from what Mr. Big can see, there's a, a short hallway uh, down at the front here. And there is the double door entrance that is here. But then there is the collapsed tower, which is actually looks like rainwater has caused the lower part of it to flood. And looking through, the, it appears that behind uh, there is in the other tower, there is a spiral staircase that leads downwards. No. And and yes, the 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 well, the knight still has his sword sheathed. The three other retainers with the knight have left their spears piled. Right, their spears and shields are piled right here. Now, uh, whatever whatever you think the good plan is is great. I just want you to know that if you need those spears gone, I might be able to get them for you. Why didn't we get? Yeah, let's get rid of the spears and then. <laughs> <laughs> Might make talking to them easier. Yes, uh, let's 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 get rid of the spears and then um yeah, well let's take let's see how that goes first. And uh, I will I will wait here to hear you report back on how well that goes. <laughs> All right. Uh I'm going to cast invisibility on myself uh because I took shadow touched. Okay. And so I have invisibility. And uh is the front door closed or open? The front door is slightly ajar. Mm. You could carefully slip through it, um, but it is closed. The tower is destroyed, and you could probably walk in through the tower or also through the windows. Um, but the the windows have bits of glass still in them, and the rubble of the tower, uh, th those both present uneven ground. Even though you're invisible, you still might cause some noise if you're not careful climbing through. I said I could turn invisible. I didn't say I was stealthy. Um, you know what? Actually, hold on. Boss, before I do this, does it make more sense for me to turn you invisible? Hmm. Actually, here's another idea. What if I send the, my Walt the rat to make some sort of noise, maybe knock something over around here to distract everybody while you come in this way to cover your noise? I don't want to steal your big moment by, you know, doing the job for you. I, well, think, I think you should be the one to go in. Yeah, Fred, you could do it. You know, you know, you know, Ted, I believe you. <laughs> nothing, nothing can go wrong if I have your support, Ted. Let's do this. I'm going to turn invisible. Okay, you turn invisible. Um, and where would you like to cause the distraction uh, with Walt? <laughs> okay, let me... Let's have Walt maybe like knock on this door and just or, or knock something over around here near this this area. So basically on this side of the building to get okay. them away. So any sound will be projected. Um, um, Matt, what I'll what I'll have you do is mm -hmm. uh, as you send uh, the the rat up to the door, roll me a d20. Sure. Three. <laughs> OK. The rat rustles up against the door to try to cause some noise. And the door is so rotted off its hinges that the rat simply brushing up against it knocks it over and it clatters to the ground with a loud crash. And you hear in the building, Ho! Oh, what was that? Someone's breaking in the back door! And the, um... 
And in <laughs> response, the knight walks towards the door, but the three retainers rush towards their spears. Oh no! This is fine. <laughs> I I'm gonna rush towards so their spears. What well. I will have you do <laughs> is Fred roll yeah. for initiative. All right. <laughs> oh, oh, good. I got a sixteen. Okay. So Fred, you've beat them for initiative. Um, but they're uh, so I'm gonna move them back to their original positions. Okay. Um, they're gonna dash for their spears. Um, what are you gonna do? I mean, I can move up to the spears and grab them, and they're gonna just float away. But mm -hmm. I. This is this is my plan is to get the spears. Okay. So I run and scoop up the spears. Okay. Um so the, uh you've used your movement. Um I'm going to have you make me an athletics check because you're running over the rubble. I got a 15. Okay. You splash through the water and the rubble, kicking up dust and a bit of mud and tracking several footprints across the floor uh, as you do so. Sco you scoop up the spears. You still have your action and bonus action remaining, but you've got the spears in hand. Uh, I dash and run back. <laughs> okay. Um, the three... Um, the three guards, um, I'm going to have them roll perception checks. Um, and the, the three of them are turning around as you run in to grab the spears, but one of them turns around and it, you, traces you as you dash away and having tracked through the water, uh, there's some muddy footprints that you left behind and, um, the, the, the three of them, they'll yell out, Something's taken our spears! A ghost! A spirit! Perhaps! By the flame! Another exclaims. And the the group of them, um, you took the spears, but you didn't take the shields, correct? Uh, apparently, yeah. Oh, I, okay. I feel like three spears was a lot to carry. <laughs> okay. It was... The, the, the three of them uh, um, and the, the knight are now visibly, uh, visibly flustered. And with the crash and the commotion, the other, uh, the uh, the other retainer outside, uh, she uh, comes uh, walking towards and opens the door, and and she still has her spear. She says, "I I heard a commotion. Is everything okay?" And the group of them confer back and forth, s trying to figure out what has just happened. Um, several of them are saying, "Is is could the chapel be haunted? Could there be a ghost?" Perhaps the spirits of the dead below are restless. What? Um, they're very confused. Um, but it doesn't look like any of them. And uh, Fred, are you going to keep making a break for it with the spears? Uh, yeah. I well, okay. I'm going to try to like run basically out of line of sight and like toss the spears almost into this corner and like hide them. Okay. Give me a stealth check. Okay. Uh, that's going to be a... Oh, wait, I get disadvantage. Cool. That's going to be an eight. Okay. Um, the spears land with a clatter outside. But with the the confusion that you've created, the group of them don't quite know what's what's going on. And they're saying, something took our spears. And the, the knight has drawn his, his blade out as well. And the 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 rest of them start fumbling across their their gear looking for a dagger or a knife if they have have e anything and um and looking around for whatever they can they can kind of scratch up one of them rips off a table leg to use it as an improvised mace what will the group of you do i, I think now that they've been kind enough to leave the horses untended um we should swing over there let the horses loose and scare them off and um but i want to check the armored horse while i'm at it for anything valuable that i might keep while we're okay. doing this um so 
I'm going to have you make me a stealth check as you go to approach the horses, because I'm assuming you're going to try to sneak through the ruins and then over to the other side, correct? My thought would be to go like that, like skirt around the side here, if that makes sense. Totally. Give yeah. me a stealth check. So that's 1d20? Yep, 1d20, and then add your stealth bonus. Okay, I keep rolling threes, so and my stealth bonus is... Uh, what is my stealth bonus? Oh, it's, it's like, so nine. Okay. Moving through the open, open area like this might not, not have been the best idea, but the distraction is still holding, and you're able to get up to the horses, although as you approach... Um, it, several of them look rather uneasy as you as you come up to them, um, and they are they might start making noise of their own. What will you do? Well, I'm happy if they want to make noise of their own. I'll take a quick check at that big armored horse, but then I want to let them all loose. I want them to make noise as they go, and I'm cool. just gonna. I'm going to hide as as soon as they're gone, as soon as cool. they're moving. Um, they they are tied they they are tied to this rock. Here, mm -hmm. you can see. So as you as they get a little bit restless, they start neighing. Um, but um, give me a slate of hand check as you examine the 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 pack on the largest horse. Sure. Big money, big money. Twenty four. Yeah. <laughs> you're able to read uh, um in, in fact with that check if you want to take the whole pack and not even bother looking at, and get a clip quick glance inside it you absolutely can sure as long as i can carry it because of yeah, course I yeah am... you can I inside the pack are three potions of healing several vials of holy water as well followers of the sacred flame because they worship fire a manifestation of fire they often carry anointed oils which are highly flammable in fact so much so that by throwing the the vial they're contained in they immediately erupt in flames so you find four of these vials in the pack two vials of holy water and three healing potions in addition to a half-eaten lunch <laughs> Am I good or am I good? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Amazing. Um, amazing. So at this point, I'm going to push my luck then by, yes, um, cutting the horses loose and spooking them off and then trying to dive under cover before anyone can come find me. Okay. The horses begin neighing with a panic as you cut the rope and begin to scurry off. I'm going to... Um, and immediately you can hear the commotion. Something's bothering the horses inside. You're going to have to hide quickly. Give me a stealth check and t let me know where you want to hide. Are, are any of these graves open? Uh, they are um, the wall into the, the crematory itself uh, is is about four feet high. You could hide behind that wall or behind the rock or behind the tree. Uh, just looking around your immediate surroundings. This is not a grave. Oh, this I'm is, sorry. This is a it's a it's a plot for cremations. I think I'm going to try and get over the wall and drop down behind it and hide there. All right. Give me an acrobatics check. And of course I suck at acrobatics, but <laughs> it should be a high well, Actually, I don't. Oh yeah. yeah. Actually 19. So. Yeah, there All right. you go. <laughs> you leap over the wall and give me one more stealth check. 11. Okay. The horses skedaddle. <laughs> 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 and as they do so the retainers burst out the front doors of the chapel in in a small group um and there's a dejected look on their face as they see the horses scamper off um they look around um and they do not see signs of your passage um and they they um the, the the one turn, turns back Sir Bryce the horses are loose and Sir Bryce says you fools we can't leave the horses get them and and so the group uh, rushes out the, the, the front door and, be, and vacates the chapel to chase down their horses in the city 
I surprise even myself sometimes. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm like pulling out tufts of grass and trying to bury the spears and like make them super hidden. Uh, I'm standing by the badger, just waiting, just waiting for instructions. Just you, you hear a voice, Ted. You did great. You did, you did just great, Ted. Is it all clear? Yeah. Did, did you get? I, did, did you get rid of them, boss? You drove them off. Was there ever any doubt? Come on, never. <laughs> now oh, man, your stories—they uh, <laughs> don't do you justice. Now. Mr. Big, hiding behind the walls of the crematory garden, you notice that behind that for you notice two things, um, Sid, as you, you know, dust yourself off and stand back up again. Behind the statue here is actually a um, a storm, a metal storm door that has a padlock on it. And the statue itself, though made of uh, tarnished marble, is actually holding a 16-foot-long rod of solid silver. Hmm. Hmm. Bad for werewolves. <laughs> Good for us. <laughs> Good for us. Yeah. Let me let me call the boys over, and um, we will we will check out this uh, this. See if we can get get the silver staff, and uh, is it loose? Um, as you go up to the silver rod, um, you it is mostly plain and featureless. It, but if you examine it physically and try to pull it out of place, you can see that there are two features to it. On the bottommost edge, there is a small triangular divot. And on the topmost edge, underneath the chin of the knight, is a button. Hmm. Want me so to press the, this button, boss? I, I think that would be good. I'm going to just back up so I can get a clear <laughs> view of what happens when you do that. How, how tall is the statue? Uh, the statue is approximately 12 feet tall. Uh, Ted. You know what to do, and I kneel over like 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 I'm a table in front. And I, cl and I climb up on your shoulders, or yeah. do, are you do? Are we doing the launch? The no, no. I'm gonna. Launch? You're gonna get up on my shoulders. You're gonna climb up me, and I'm gonna stand up. All right, Ted, you got it. I got it, and I All press right. the button. As you press the button, there is this small arcane whir that hits the air, just like a pew. Mm. And the rod slides out through the statue's fingers and lands on the ground with a clatter. Oh, free rod. Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> I did it, boss. Good job, Ted. Good job. You too, Fred. Oh, thanks. The, though it appears to be made of silver, the rod wasn't damaged by the fall, and it's surprisingly heavy Heavier than you would expect for a silver... Like, a silver rod is pretty heavy, but it, this is hefty, um, given given its size and weight. This weighs more than my giant sword. I don't so actually know, but... The, the the divot is in the rod itself? Yes, there's a... Uh, there, the, the rod itself is 16 inches long and about uh, one inch in diameter. There's a triangular divot on one side and a button on the top of the other okay. and the the divot is not on the top it, it's it's on the cylindrical part not at the flat circular part but the button is on the circular part so boss some... weren't they talking about a key or something you know this this could be it huh um well, let's go around now and check out the great you one of you gentlemen hang on to that uh that silver that silver key it's mine. as we hope it I, will be. I pulled it out okay I'm still invisible, by the way. So I was just picking up the fl like it was a floating <laughs> rod, and you were like, "No, Ted, or no." Fred, and I'm fighting my... with a, an invisible rod in the yeah. middle of the courtyard. So tell me more about the grade. Is it a regular lock? Um, it is a it is a slightly rusted but regular, pretty bog standard padlock on uh, on what is a metal storm door. So the the hinges are uh, underneath the door mm -hmm. itself. 
Uh, there's a handle underneath the padlock such that just like the little storm doors that lead down to a basement, this would mm-hmm. probably open up and, and have a stair underneath. Okay, let me try and uh, pick the lock. Yeah. Um, if you bust out your thieves tools, yep. you can make a dexterity check and add your proficiency modifier. So it's a thieves tools check. So it'd be a plus six, I believe, unless you unless you took expertise in thieves tools. Uh, no, I didn't. It's, okay. Mine is in sleight of hand deception. So um, that would be 10 plus six. Yeah. 16. Wow. 16. It takes about a minute of picking around, but the lock opens up. It's worthless now. It's never going to lock again, but it's open. Dang. <laughs> All right. Let's open the grate and look inside. I will you know, peek in carefully. As you open the grate, there is an extremely steep set of stairs leading down to a, a circular stone chamber, approximately 15 feet wide, with a... Um, with an oaken door at the opposite end of the circular chamber. There's a bunch of leaves all gathered around the base, uh, leaves and dirt and dust and a, a bit of pooling water that are down here. Um, it, but uh, otherwise, the the chamber's pretty. Actually, smells like a basement down there. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna send the boys down first, and uh, you know, if if it seems okay to them, I will follow. Ted, sweet baby, childlike, innocent little Ted. Yeah, Fred? I'm going to go first. Oh, you're so brave. Thank you. I know. I know. Um, Are you going? <laughs> I'm still invisible. So, yes. I I've can't already... tell if you're going or not. There's no sound. I'm already gone. Okay. You down there? So now we are in this dark and dank cellar. So. Oh, the dankness. There we I go. I can't see anything. Excellent. Uh, so I will. Uh, I'm just going to put uh, Mr. Big and Ted your tokens there until uh, until you decide to come down the stairs. So Fred, you come into this small circular chamber chamber about 15 feet wide. There's an oaken door uh, with a doesn't appear to be a lock on the door. Um, right in front of you. Uh, hey, boss and bro. Um... <laughs> <laughs> my psy- my psychic sense is telling me that there's a door in this room and it's unlocked. What do I do next, boss? Uh, this is, once again, this is your moment. I think you should go check that out. <laughs> oh, man, I'm just having so many moments. You can do it. You, you can do it, Fred. <laughs> All right, I Ted. W- w- believe in you. With you believing in me, I can do anything. And I walk up and I'm just going to push this door open. Cool. Um, You... Push the door open. Um, it's a little stuck. It actually takes a full action to push the door open. Yeah. Um, and past um, at, past here, um, well, the light from outside shines down into the chamber that you were in um, and fills the hallway ahead. Past here, there is no light down here. Uh, I really can't see you, Fred. <laughs> Ted, I'm still invisible. Oh. But I can't see you either because it's really... Oh, no, wait, there you are. You're behind me. I just had to turn around. Guys, it's dark down I'm coming down. There's a short, narrow hallway um, that extends deeper towards where the chapel is proper. It veers off to the north um, after a few feet and then to the south after a few more. Hmm. Uh... Boss, we might need some uh, some light down here. I can't can't see a thing in this in this tunnel. Sure, yeah. Let's let's you know you guys light up some torches or whatever you've got for light, <laughs> and uh, I you know I have my my MFAT, the uh, multifunction arcane trickster tool, which among other things has a, a little bit of a, a lighter on it if I need it. But I'll let them carry the torches. I you know I don't want to. I, I don't want to you know give them their their moment to shine. I will kind of stay behind in the Shine. darkness i uh i light my torch and i strike the exact pose from my art that i made but no I'm one can torch. see it it's I'm just invisible. a torch floating and i stand there looking like with my sword and my torch wind blowing through my hair and, and no i know that i'm see. having a moment and nobody nobody sees yeah. it but all right with the with illumination in hand 
Which way will you go, Fred? So You're leading the way? I guess so. Uh, Ted. Yeah? Can you come up to the floating torch? Okay, so I'm going to stand next to the floating torch. Okay. Or I guess Can right I behind it, is it too, if it's too narrow. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a, it, it's pretty narrow uh, in, in the passage here, only about four feet wide. Ted, I'm a little scared. What do you, what do, you, what do I do? Look, if there's anything I know that you carried us through some tough times and you've been carrying Mr. Big stuff this whole way and now you're carrying a torch and if there's anything you can do it's keep carrying so I think you could do it carry on uh, I'm going to start walking <laughs> down and I come to the I, I walk and I'm right floor. beside you or right behind you I'm, just I'm, I'm kind floating. of holding your sleeve and like leading you with me as you shine the torch there is a before you in uh, down this hallway, it opens into another circular chamber. In the center of the chamber is a font of holy water, um, which, despite the fact that it has been left here for 15 years, is remarkably clear still. Um, the there are several, there's rows of shelves around it in this room. Um, and the shelves um, have on them um, pieces of flint and steel and um, several vials as well of the same fluid and oil that uh, Mr. Big found in the Paladin's pack. Um, so there's several there's several vials arranged on shelves around this. Oh, as well as prepared vials of the holy water itself. Uh, hey, boss, it looks like we got some uh, really clean water and some uh, fire starting equipment going on in here. So this is all that really explosive, volatile fluid. The the, the uh, fire starting stuff is the same stuff. You throw it and it'll explode. Yes. Uh, I think we should carefully load up on that and <laughs> might as well take the holy water as well. I, I guess I can use the same pack I'm already carrying with uh, yeah. other stuff in it and just, you know, uh, and to, to be correct, it's incendiary in nature, not explosive in nature. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Yes. Uh, but it will ignite if you throw it. Yes. Should yeah. I, Ted, you know, being the smarter and older of the two brothers, it's just dawning on me now that walking into the explosive uh, fiery room with the lit torch might be a bad idea. That's do why you wanna, the brains. Do you want to take the lead on this one? Uh, absolutely. And I'm going to run past the torch kind of squeezing my way through my big brother and uh run into the room and start uh collecting any uh any vials yeah, however dimly lit they are just grabbing yeah. them yeah um some of the vials um have been opened for several years and thus lost their alchemical potency um the the kind of the the stoppers on them have rotted or 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 failed but you are able to find seven intact vials of, of this fluid. Yeah, we'll put those all in my pack. Um, <laughs> I run back <laughs> eagerly to uh, Mr. Big presenting the hall like uh, in like a bag. In addition to the fire starting equipment, there are uh, several empty jars in this room as well. Um, and the font of holy water itself um, probably contains a few liters of water. Yo, Ted, if you fill the jars with the water, we can sell holy water at our new shop. Uh, f Fred and Ted's uh, Holier Than water. Thou um, Water Emporium. This is why I let you make up the names, Ted. You know, uh, Glacial Fresh. F fresh from the, the spring of the sacred flame. Brilliant. I'm working on the uh, marketing. We'll make millions. I'm going to fill sure. up my water skin, too. I'm just going to start filling uh, Okay. with all the uh, as much holy water as I can take, as I can muster. <laughs> so is this all point, right. is it reasonably safe to have fire in this room? Um, reasonably defined, <laughs> depending on your definition of reasonable, <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering, since I'm noticing there's another passage out, we'll probably want to be able to yeah. see down that one, too. You know, before we go, though, I'm just going to pop over to this corner and peek around it. Okay. Peeking around the corner, 
you can see that there is another one of these tiny chambers. Um, the chamber, again, is circular, vaulted at the top. Uh, so they, they, these chambers kind of have a bell shape to them. So they're domed at the top, and then they, they flare downward. In the center of this room is an iron pillar three feet high. Hmm. It doesn't go all the way up to the ceiling. And then I, I can see that there's two more passages out of there, right? Yes. Yeah. Boss, I guess, I got, no, I'm going to guess the one on the left probably links up to the stairs into the chapel. Hmm. But, Boss, hmm. I got to say, you know, every time I go into a dungeon here in this city, ever since uh, me and my brother moved in here, they're, they're very labyrinthian. They're very maze-like. Yeah, like a maze, like a puzzle. Yeah, they're all, and there's so many dungeons. It's like, it's like, why not just like, it's just all the dungeons of Drakenheim, you know, just mazes and monsters, and it's been horrible. I, uh, I hope they make a book cataloging, cataloging all that soon, so I can take note. But Fred, you uh, think you might have just heard someone laugh? Thanks, boss. I, I like to think that I'm pretty good at jokes, but was that uh, that was you that laughed, right? Uh, no. Um, Ted. Do we know which way this laugh came from? Fred heard it coming from the 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 halls in the room beyond. So Fred heard it first. Did I laugh? I didn't laugh. Doesn't sound like you. So we're talking about the lower room or the the one with the holy water? The, the lower room. Yeah, the one with the post. All right. Whichever one of us is uh, the bravest should go first. Or oldest. Is that you're, you're going to make it's boss you. go first? It, no, it's you. You go, Fred. You're just you've got the torch. Okay, and all right. you heard the laugh. All right, all right. I I walk towards where I think I maybe heard laughter. Okay, walking towards the chamber. Hmm. I always love that sentence. <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Click click click. Um, you now can see that the the passage with the first of all the passage to the east is actually a short set of stairs that go downward sharply the other passage ends in a doorway the passage that ends in a doorway you hear some mumbling some grumbling and maybe what sounds like the sound of uh, falling dust um and you hear this squeaky voice cr say, Stop touching me! Uh, I'm going to place the torch down on the three-foot pedestal. Like, I want it to remain lit, but I'm just going to place mm -hmm. it there so we have a light source. Yeah, you place the 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 torch down on the, the pedestal itself, um, which goes directly into the floor. As you do so, you notice that there is a small hole cut in the top part of the cylindrical pedestal that is about one inch wide. Gosh, what do we know that's also <laughs> one inch wide? My finger. <laughs> no. No? Fred, okay. it's too... We measured it last time. No, I know. I was I was trying to be funny, but it's probably the pole that you're carrying. Now that you have an audience, it. now that you have yeah, a, yeah, yeah, <laughs> in yeah. the other room, you're just... <laughs> but before we get to that, there, I'm still invisible. Um, I now have placed the torch down. Uh, boss, do you th do you think I should call out to these people? They're going to open the door. They're not going to see anything. Should I get a look at them? And Me? and Fred, as you place the light down, one of the things that you can also see is just glint glancing down the stairs. There's candlelight at the bottom of the stairs. Boss, we got light coming from those stairs. We got mumbles and grumbles coming from from this door. What 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 do I do? I think you should go check out the mumbles and grumbles, but don't call out. Just see if you can, you know, sort of get a better picture of what's beyond that door. And I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna wait back here and keep an eye on your brother, protect him from anything that may come up behind us. <laughs> That's good thinking, boss. Oh, he, so he's so cherub-like, really for innocent. Me. <laughs> I'm going to uh I'm going to use um my uh sorcerer feature 
telepathic speech and I'm going to create a connection between my good brother Fred and myself Ted and uh, we can now speak with our minds for the next four minutes can I speak Ooh. back to you oh yeah that brotherly bond okay <laughs> so Fred leading the way you approach the door looking very carefully under the door give me a perception check all right I got a 17. There's a faint glimmer of purple green light under coming from the crack under the door. And you can very clearly hear there are some small voices coming from the other room. I'll say, He touched me first! No, he touched me! He's you're not supposed to touch uh, yeah, don't no! Ah. And and then you hear that what sounds like a bit of a, a slapping noise and maybe the sound of a whooshing flame. And some other squabbling, mumbling, and grumbling. Uh, I come back and I tell the other two, it looks like we got a, a, a bunch of people trying to pull off a comedy routine here. Uh, trying to make jokes and be silly and slapping each other. I don't know. It's wild. Did you so, see anything? I just told you what I saw, Ted. Okay. <laughs> you... you I'm going to move up a little bit and then I want to send Walt the rat down the stairs very quietly to just check out what's down there. Okay. Um, I will give you a preview of what is down the stairs as you uh, um, do so. So. Moment. Okay, I will uh, just going to switch the map there, gents, because your tokens aren't down here yet. I won't bring them in yet, but here we go. As you send Walt down the stairs, Mr. Big, you see that down here is a the stairway passage ends in a cavernous chamber, whereupon there are five stone plinths upon which are laid the skeletal remains of several warriors and priests. There are an array of candles surrounding each uh, stone sarcophagi, although the, the bodies lay on top of the sarcophagi. And though the candles, the candles burn, but there's no visible melting wax. Hmm. It's a good thing nobody ever comes back from the dead. Um, okay, I don't know. I, I think we should we should probably um, deal with what's on our level first before we go down here. So um, uh, I'm gripping the holy water uh, ever ever so tightly <laughs> to my chest. That makes sense, boss. Ted, what is it you're always saying about staying on the same level, right? Got to stay level. Um, that's it yep uh don't go up or don't go down stay where you are and you'll be found actually what we should probably try to do let's see what that rod does if we try to insert it in this iron pillar use the rod great thinking boss you have the rod ted oh yeah yep yeah. and uh hey <laughs> I, I pull out the rod and i i approach the pillar and i'm gonna try to put it into the uh the hole it fits perfectly, and by rotating it, you actually hear a, a light snap as it locks into place. I'm sorry, I broke it. Um, it, it, it the same kind of lock that, say, like a, a bicycle, like a that that kind of like popping uh, ball bearing sort of lock. So you can twist it to release it again. It slides in, um, and uh, the now it is a handle protruding about twelve inches around the uh, out from the from the pedestal itself with the button protruding on the end. I'm going to step back and watch you push the button. <laughs> Go ahead, Ted. I put my hand on your shoulder. Pushing the button. Uh, you push the button. There and is a small <laughs> noise. Now this has become the scepter of St. Vitruvia. Mission complete. I try to push it like like a handle like i try to push it while holding the button while holding the button you try to push it and it does not 
move. You push with every ounce of your strength and push and push and push. It does not move. Now, Ted, you're not doing it right. I I help. (laughs) The two of you push and push and push. And you double check to make sure it, you're not pushing a pull. Yeah, you but pu- you pull. Tr- okay. Fred, you pull. I'm but it seems like this rod is just utterly immovable. Hey, you remember that thing we used to have in the shop? What was it called? It was a rod that was completely immovable. It reminds me of this. It was the broom, and you never picked it up. <laughs> but I'm bam. No, I think I know what you mean, and I'm gonna hit it again. You press the button. Then uh, and there's another boom sound. What do you do? I try to push it again. It pushes. <gasps> it pushes. So as you push the rod, the uh, the whole apparatus rotates like a winch, and you can hear underneath. There's like a, a sounds like a chain is being wound up. Okay, I keep pushing. Okay. Fred, help me. Uh, you you push um, for about 10 seconds, and it goes completely 360 degrees around. And at that point, as you push, it doesn't push any further. And then I click the button. Okay. You've clicked the button. Well, And it holds in place. Ted, you solved something. I don't know what it is yet, but you did it. I, uh... I'm really proud of myself. Uh, I think I deserve a drink, and I'm going to take a little uh, sip of this holy water. All right. Just uh, make sure it's of uh, a highest quality before we sell it. It tastes divine. <laughs> uh, so, boss, I think we probably just uh, opened a door or a gate or something somewhere, uh, probably unlocking the secrets of this entire place. In Pretty the handy to bring us to, huh? Uh-huh. And, I'm, and I'm now thinking to myself that we could probably leave those noisy uh, slapstick guys down at the end of the corridor to their own their own devices and go downstairs and check out what's there. And since you you solved this puzzle, I again I I only feel it's right that you guys lead the way. <laughs> well, Ted, uh, since honored. you since you passed the puzzle, why don't you go first this time? Here, take the torch. <gasps> You've got this. I know Feel you do. For the first time, feeling like he's the big brother now, Ted uh, uh, leads the the trio down into the depths um, of the graves. Still, but now reinforcing his drinking of the <laughs> holy water to protect the inside, he holds the holy water in his hand for the outside. Not a fan of the undead. Ted, you got this. Nothing, nothing bad has happened here. This. There's, there's no. I got this. We're in we're in the outskirts of Drakenheim. What could what could go wrong? Like, it's not like another meteor is going to crash into this place. Don't don't, don't give fate ideas, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you step down in, into the chamber, and now you can all see what uh, Walt saw earlier. There are five uh, skeletal bodies placed upon stone sarcophagi. Several of the bones have been wrapped in, uh, tightly wrapped in linens, but what whatever remained of these people is long gone. Um, a few of them have a, a clasp holy symbols to their chests. Um, two of them hold maces. One holds a sword. A shield is placed atop another. One, ac- a few of them have bits and pieces of what might have been the remains of armor or a helmet. Um, and there is an, an inscription underneath. Um, saying their their name and and so looking through you can see that these are the inscriptions of former flame keepers and paladins of the sacred fire uh that uh were acolytes at this chapel at some point in life uh boss are we grave robbers i i like to be flexible um (laughs) flexibility you know is is key to being successful in this world um so the plinths are solid right they're not actual or are they or are they actual sarcophagi? Is, is the implication that there could be something inside them as well? Um, it, it is. It is common knowledge uh, in the context of this world that this pra- this burial practice, that the followers of the sacred fire believe that while most people are cremated, they believe that their paladins and clerics 
bodies may be used as vessels uh, in a time of great need. So they preserve the bodies of their clerics and paladins and lay them on these stone plinths. So no, there, there's no, there would be no contents. It would be okay. a so, likely a, a solid piece of stone, unless of course they were hiding something. <laughs> okay. Um, does does do any of the bodies look distinctive? Like first of all, do any are any of them holding anything that looks valuable? Um, several of them are holding holy symbols that are made of gold or silver, and would probably be worth anywhere from twenty five to fifty gold. Um, several of them have weapons uh, that are in varying states of decay, uh, but nothing remarkable when it comes to the weapons themselves. Boss, do you say we pocket these holy symbols? I mean, they ain't using them. We gotta get close to that thousand gold. We, we... And, you know, I mean, you say, you say 50 gold, but come on, when I get, when I get to my fence and get talking, it's gonna be more like 150, 200, so, um... What? Yeah, no, it's, it's... You can promise us that type of gold? I I think so. Ah, oh, your um, resume. Your resume. <laughs> Boss, I'm so happy we found you. We were just, we had no idea what we were Down doing. Down on our luck. Uh, it's so lucky we found you. As I say, as I walk over to one of the plinths and rip a holy symbol <laughs> off of the skeleton. <laughs> Desecrating. Lift the holy symbol off the skeleton. All the candles in the room. All of them. Snuff out. Not, not just the one around that one, huh? <laughs> Ed, I told you to watch the magic. We need light in here. Does the torch go out too? Um, roll a d6. Oh, <laughs> baby. Uh, six. It does not. It yes! does not. It stays, it stays lit. I, I use press and agitation to try to keep it from going out in this, this snuff out. Mm-hmm. Uh, did I do that or did you? <laughs> uh oh. As as the uh, um as the candles go out, there's a shuddering and a rattling of the bones as they they begin rising up off the stone ped- pedestals mm-hmm. and let out a low crying moan, and they, you just hear the whisper of one word on uh, um whispering through the bones, defilers. Roll for initiative. So that's d20 plus... Uh, plus your dexterity. Yep. Yep. Okay. I rolled a six plus uh, four. So ten. Okay. I got a, I got 11. 11 uh, for Fred. And a solid five for Ted. And Walt gets a 16, not that that's going to help much. <laughs> the um, the way we run familiars, to keep it simple, we okay. always have them go on your turn. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Guys, I think the paladins that were here before us defiled this crypt and, and made these guys angry. Yeah, don't take, don't carry this, Fred, out of here. You know, you didn't do anything wrong. Okay. Unfortunately, the, skele- the skeletons will be going first. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they cool. rise up from their graves, several of them reaching for what remains of their their weapons, and um, with uh, with rattling bones lumber towards uh, uh, towards you. Um, so, Fred, as you were the one that picked up uh, something, three of them are going to rush in to attack you. Makes sense. <laughs> um, and one will rush for Ted, and one will rush for Mister Big. So, uh, striking with what remains of their weapons and their claws, three attack you, Fred. Um, wow, that's a horrible dice roll. A one, a two, and a nine. So that would be a miss, a six, and a 13 to hit. Um, I, I actually, like, as they come up, I push my sword against them and just kind of shove them back. Okay. And Ted, I'm very sorry, but I get a 22 to hit you. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, that connects. <laughs> uh, which is going to be uh, a total of six points of slashing damage as it comes back around the corner and rakes its, cl- uh, the, its bony fingers across your back. Mr. Big, um, looking at what Fred was doing, you don't, the, the, the 
Flamekeeper beside you takes this mace and you just turn at the last moment as the mace swings around and hits you in the face for a critical hit. Oh, oh, oh that this is fine. <laughs> uh, and you're going to take 10 points of damage from the mace to the face. Mr. Big! Mr. Big. <laughs> Us! That, that can't be good for business. I'm I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> With that, Fred, it is your turn. Uh, Fred turns to the one that hurt his brother. Uh, he shoves these three off of him, and he hears his brother cry out, and he cries out too. Ah! And he turns and he goes, Ted, I feel your pain. And I'm going to chop at this uh, zombie that is, or this skeleton that's attacking Ted. Cool. I got a 15. That is a hit. All right. Uh, that's going to be 20 damage. Um, you're, With your greatsword, you cleave this guy down, just smashing through bone and bits of skull that just all clatter to the ground in um, uh, in, in pieces. Uh, you've taken the Great Weapon Master feat, right? Absolutely. Uh, so that that's means I let get you to... attack as a bonus action, yeah. Yeah, so I turn to the next one, and I'm like, go back to sleep! And I... <laughs> Attack again, uh, getting an 18 for also hit. Uh, 19 damage. Uh, you are some useful muscle uh, as you send the pieces of bone and skulls scattering across the room. Ted, you okay? Ah, uh, yeah, thank you, Fred. You saved me. That's what I do. What about you, boss? You, you doing okay? I'm fine. I'm going <laughs> to. Mr. Big, it is your turn. Um, I, I'm holding some holy water in the pack, right? Correct. Can I throw one of those vials at the one that's attacking me? Absolutely, you can. Uh, it, it will be an attack roll using, uh, just use your same attack modifier that you use for any of your other weapons. Okay, 12. Uh, with a, a 12, that Six is a hit. Yeah, okay. Yep, that is a yeah! hit. Yeah! Get him, boss. Uh, so the holy water... Um, splashed on these creatures deals 3d6 radiant damage. Okay, let me grab another d6. Wow. That's going to be 13. 13? Splash with the holy water. It There's a searing sound as it hits the bones and it clatters to the floor. Whew. I thought these guys were supposed to come back for a great purpose. <laughs> Doesn't seem that great. I said, it's fine. Ted, <laughs> it's your turn. Uh, I, I, You just see me watching in awe as this thing is destroyed by the holy water. And I reach into my uh, my my water pack that I filled with holy water. And I <laughs> and I squirt the one right in front of me. Uh, cool. G give me an attack roll as well. <laughs> with a big... With a big, hefty squirt, I get a uh, like a twenty-one. It's a hit, three d six radiant. Ooh, fourteen damage. Ah, oh. and once again, as soon as the water splashes on it, there's the searing noise, and just like the like a cord is cut on the bones, and they clatter, clatter right to the ground. And I and I take a step back behind uh, behind Fred. Okay. Fred, the last remaining skeleton, furiously uh, cr uh, uh, cry, uh, uh, cries out as it slashes at you, uh, getting a 16 to hit. That is my AC. Alrighty. So there it is. And that will be six points of slashing damage. Ow! <laughs> I, t I take it. <laughs> and it is your turn, Fred. Uh, I immediately turn back to him with my giant sword that's as big as he is and i was like <laughs> what kind of paladin are you it's a bad one-liner but i tried um and get then up, I, Fred. I get a three to hit <laughs> it goes totally wide it's a miss um cool <laughs> that's that's i think all i got mr big we're over to you um, I've still got more holy water, right? So, 
I think yeah. I, w- I will move in closer and uh, or act not now. Nah, maybe I won't move in closer, but I will move up a little bit and then throw it at him. So, yeah, uh, go for it. Uh, and that is a 15. Once more, the the flask of holy water cl- uh, crashes against its rib cage. And <laughs> we get uh, seven points of damage that time. Not quite enough to cut the ties that is animating this creature, I'm afraid. Ted, we're over to you. Unless, Mr. Big, is there anything else you'd like to do? Um, I guess, uh, do I have any other attack possibilities besides the throw? Uh, what, with a throw, no, unless you've got, unless you've picked up an ability with your character. Remember, as a, as a rogue, you can always dash and disengage and hide as a bonus action. So you can always take an action in battle and then um, either basically move twice, um, move out of combat, move out of engagement range, basically, or um, or hide uh, behind something if you want to. That's kind of the fun thing with a rogue is that you don't get to attack twice. You always get to kind of have that extra mobility and that and that ability and eh, trickery. Let's move over a little bit further here, but, you know, just to not steal Fred's glory when he kills it. <laughs> <laughs> And, and just as, as a reminder, um, uh, Matt, um, in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, uh, you can always break up your movement between Right, that's actions. that's what I was, yeah, that's what I figured yeah. there. I've got 25. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm slow but thoughtful. Great. Ted, we're over to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whip a firebolt at him, see if I can finish off this, uh, putting away my wine, my wine skin. Um, but getting yeah. a solid 23 to hit. Wow. I, I, I follow Mr. Big's advice and I squirted him the first time, but then uh, shooting over my uh, my brother's shoulder, I only do three fire damage. That is enough to send the bones scattering. We could have used water. You guys were using water and fu- like <laughs> the elements, <laughs> dear Fred. <laughs> I'm, you know, a very Ted, relig- I'm a very religious person. <laughs> I, are you? Um, so you must know a lot about these crypts then. And and it will be revealed in due time. <laughs> Clever. <laughs> always always the wise one, boss. Always the wise one. I like that. The the crypt remains dark, the bones silently uh, silently resting on the cavern floor. Um, the candles are out, but the, the, your torch lights the rest of the, of this chamber. Um, there is a passage that continues to the West. Let's just, you know, do some light ransacking, make sure we haven't missed anything in here (laughs) and, uh, you know, anything valuable worth having these guys carry for me. I, I, (laughs) so I pick up a symbol off a dead cleric yeah like, we're, we gather their hands <laughs> yeah there's there's a fair amount of loot to be had um some of their weapons are still intact um uh and in fact um you can actually see that the um several of them had um either bits uh, uh um many of them would actually have placed on their eye sockets bloodstones or uh, a bloodstone or a small uh, bit of amethyst uh, or a bit of onyx on on their eyes kind of giving this like irregular like um, two different eye colors sort of effect to them and so uh, each had their holy symbol worth 150 gold worth 50 gold and the gemstones in their eyes are worth 50 gold apiece so from each body you can salvage about 150 gold well, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to overload these guys. So I will carry the gems. <laughs> Thanks, boss. I got I the rest. Thinking of us, boss. I'm uh, strapping it to uh, Fred's backpack, like in like little pouches and stuff, like little crevices and canisters. Uh, yeah, just load it on there. I got it. <laughs> onward, onward, and and forward. I there guess are. I'm not invisible anymore. No. No. I hear some, I, the, the, this seems to continue, uh, boss. There seems to be uh, more down this way as I kind of lead along with the torch. 
Yeah, as you as you look down the hall, um, uh, the kind of this cavern, this this is more of a roughly hewn passage than a hall. Um, it so there, it's roughly dug, but it continues onward. Um, before you can actually see a couple more lit candles at the end of this passage, there at the end of the passage is an open doorway. Um, so, uh, um, there, there's clearly stone architecture and you can see the base part of this door that has been lifted up and there's the, the heavy divot in the ground where it has been brought up from opening this door. It looks like there's a carving or an inscription on the door of some kind, but raised up into the ceiling, you, you can't read it. Um, but you can see into the room beyond, which again is a roughly cavernous uh, stone chamber in this chamber there is there are several um piles of ashes and urns around candelabras but in the center of the chamber is a large um is a large um again stone platform with a mummified corpse upon it um the mummified corpse um has a mask over its face and a sheet lightly draped over top of it and is holding prayer beads in its hands. What you can see though looking up is that it looks like there's a crack in the ceiling because there's water that has been f dripping down and has actually put out all the candles that were arranged around this body. And so the, the, the sheet on it is waterlogged and the, the damage that has come through. Um, if you're thinking in terms of the rough geography, this would roughly correspond to right underneath the collapsed tower where, those, where there was the pooled rainwater as well. So it seems like something has seeped in through the earth and has actually now fallen on the, the corpse and turned here. Whoever this person was seems significantly more important than the others that are in, in, in turn here. But um, again, with the door opened up, you can't see the inscription to know who it was. Hmm. Ted, I think you opened this door upstairs. Yeah, you're right. I didn't even think about that. I'm genius. And I, uh. <laughs> Boss, whoever's in this room is way more important than those other guys. I'm saying we can probably find at least twice the loot here. Maybe this is where they keep the staff. The hmm. scepter. We're the... getting into the scepter business. The staff scepter. <laughs> the, the staff of healing the the expensive one so mm. the the body is waterlogged which means it might not burn so easily but i'm wondering if you know this wouldn't be holy water dripping on it right so no this would be rainwater dripping on it so why didn't one of you guys go up and pour some holy water on it maybe we can take it out before it you know wakes up uh, ted you have the holy water do you do you want me to come with you <laughs> Hold do this, and I'm gonna shove the uh, the torch uh, in your face. Do you want me to hold to... your hand like last time? Just get, stay close. Just stay close. Okay, okay. And I'm gonna approach the uh, the body, okay. just taking my time, going not not quickly, but not slowly. I wanted to see if anything changes as I get closer. Alrighty, make a perception check. Oh, I'm not too. <laughs> Uh, I get a, uh, a an eight. Um, as you walk up towards the mummy, carefully eyeing eyeing it, you're about with, the, with my with my holy water in hand. With, with, with your holy water in hand, as you are about to pour on it, it shudders to life with a screech. Um. <laughs> And Fred and Mr. Big, I'm going to have you both make perception checks as well. Let's see. Got an 18. 16. Okay. Ted is very surprised by this, but Fred and Mr. Big, you are not. <laughs> as the mummy... Um, Compassed it. Just, just snaps right up at the waist to, to its feet. Um, bringing around its 
opening up its hand and reaching to smash the vial out of Ted Oates' hands. I think this is where we will take our break. And we are back from our break. We have finished our short rest, refreshed all of our consumables, and are ready to take on another uh, another round. Um, before we, we, we dive back in, we got a few uh, plugs and promos to give. Of course, we are joined this evening by our wonderful guest, author Matt Ruff. Um, and Matt, let us know, where can people find your stuff? And uh, what are you working, what's what's coming down the pipeline for you? Wherever fine books are sold. And uh, actually the, the latest thing which just dropped uh, last week was uh, the, uh, the paperback edition of 88 Names, which again is uh, it's set about 20 years in the future at the point when VR finally works the way we've all always dreamed it is. And uh, the, uh, the protagonist, a guy named John Chu, is what's known as a Sherpa. He's basically kind of like you if you lived your whole life online. He sort of, if you want to play a, a, an MMO RPG, but you have a life and you don't have 200 hours to devote to building up your paladin, you can pay this guy and he will cater an adventure for you and give you a ready-made character, a team of players to, uh, you know, of skilled teammates to come with you and, and cater a night's adventure. And uh, he gets a new client who uh, claims to be a wealthy, famous person with powerful enemies who uh, wants an all expenses paid guide, guided tour of the world of VR gaming. And he's willing to pay $100,000 a week, which is one of those deals that sounds way too good to be true, but the money's real. So he takes the gig. Um, but as it gets underway, he begins to suspect that that this client is actually the North Korean dictator Kim Jong Un. Um, <laughs> so it's yeah, it's basically a a cat and mouse cyber thriller set largely online. Um, and then there's also a, a a sort of twisted romantic comedy element because in addition to worrying about North Korean assassins and Chinese spies, he's also going to deal with his angry ex girlfriend who's promised to get even with him. So um, it's it's a it's a fun romp. And a lot of the action takes place in various online game worlds, including, uh, you know, uh, a very D and D like uh, universe. So I think, I think people will enjoy it. So that's, that's the new thing for me. Ooh. Amazing. Yes, nice. please, please. One of, one of the things that we always tell the viewers on our show is that one of the, one of the best ways to uh, play better D and D is to read more books because you oftentimes a dungeon master is only as good as the strength of their literary references. <laughs> um, so uh, I highly re recommend checking out uh, Matt, Matt's stuff. Uh, Kelly, other uh, uh, other news and, and announcements for, for us before we dive back in? Well, if you're enjoying the stream and you want to help support our work, you can make sure to check us out on Patreon. You can find out how by following the links below or at patreon.com slash dungeon underscore dudes. For those of you who don't know, our Discord community is exclusive for our patrons. So if you do join us on Patreon, you can jump on our Discord, chat with all of us. Uh, we have some really exciting things going on there right now. We do monthly writers rooms where you can help Monty and I work on scripts for upcoming episodes and we have monthly Q&As where we answer patron submitted questions. On top of that we have a lot of chat right now regarding the upcoming book that we are releasing. We are turning Dungeons of Drakenheim season one of our campaign into a campaign guide for fifth edition. So Monty and I have been hard at work at that writing up a storm it's uh, the Kickstarter is going to launch in June. You can find the links below for the mailing list for that or go to drakenheim.com. And uh, yeah, check out all of our stuff there. Fantastic. With that, uh, I think we were rolling for initiative, gentlemen. <laughs> Let's all get killed. Yeah. The uh, mummy. And uh, Ted, you are surprised. I, I'm always surprised at the things I get into with these two characters. Okay, I rolled 18 this time. Woo. I got a 16. And Ted? 12. Just <laughs> holding up the rear. <laughs> All right. So as Ted approaches, Mr. Big, you're actually the first one to see the mummy stirring. What will you do? Well, the fun thing is I'm looking over all of my arcane spells and realizing they don't really work really well on undead stuff. So uh, I'm just going to I'm going to try and hit it with a firebolt as it's getting up. 
Um, I think that's probably the only thing I can do from this range. Uh, so let me try that. Uh, Light it up. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll hope it's not too wet. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll be fine. This will dry it off a bit. I rolled a one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the shot sail. Uh, so you, you can imagine the mummy turns sharply upright as 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 Ted goes to approach it. And just as it starts to turn, Mr. Big, you f- throw the firebolt and it sails right past the mummy and then the mummy sits up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so like you're you're anticipating it rising and you fire where it's going to be, but it doesn't rise as quickly as you expect it to. So basically it's the mummy's fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can play. Yeah. This okay. fireball whizzes past my head. In- incompetence <laughs> everywhere. And in my enemies. Uh, with, with that, Fred, it is your turn. You also see the mummy stirring up as, as Mr. Big th- hurls a firebolt behind you, and you see this creature uh, reaching for your brother's neck. I yell, Ted, no! And I <laughs> run, and I pull up my sword, and you hear me yell, psionic strike! And I smash the mummy with my sword. My eyes are glowing with, uh, that's how they glow, that's what it looks like, Uh, with magical energy as I take my sword down upon this foe. Uh, Getting a 10 to hit. Uh, um, The as your your blade comes down upon the the creature, um, it digs into a part of its flesh, but there's there's like nothing there to damage ah! where, where where you hit it. Like like you kind of rise up, kind of catch it in the side of the like underneath its rib cage, but there's no flesh there anymore, so it it misses. So I just like jam the sword in, and I'm like, oh oh, oh no, oh no, Ted. Mm. That's it. Ted, you're surprised, so you won't be acting this turn. But with with the greatsword still in its chest, the mummy takes the claw that was bound for Ted's face and instead shoots Ted an awful glare while bringing its other rotting fist up to strike Fred. So Ted, you are affected by its dreadful glare and need to make a wisdom saving throw. But Fred, I'm gonna smash it. Uh, Fred, I get a twenty-three to hit you. Yeah, that hits. <laughs> uh, Fred, you're gonna be taking a total of ten bludgeoning damage and six necrotic damage for sixteen uh, total. You know, I'm gonna throw up a protective field, so I. My eyes glisten as he goes to punch me, and I'm going to reduce the damage uh, by... um, Oh, that was sad. uh, By four. Okay. That said, you've still taken this damage, and you feel an otherworldly curse seeping over your body. Give me a constitution saving throw. Oh, God, I feel cursed. You okay, Fred? No. Oh, wait, maybe. I got a 22. <laughs> okay, you are not cursed with mummy rot. <laughs> I'm fine, Ted. I'm actually fine. You observed that punch for me. I really appreciate that. He really jumped out on me. Uh, but Ted, you are reflected by the dreadful glare. I need a wisdom saving throw. I got you, a 17. Oh, you love it. You are not scared of this thing at all, even though it pierces right into your soul and you see mortality reflected in your own eyes. Um, okay. With that, we go to the top of the round with Mr. Big. There is no damage on the board against the mummy. Well, it doesn't seem to like holy water. I guess the question is whether we can hit it with any. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, move up and, uh, throw, uh, some, another flask of holy water at it. Okay. Make an attack roll. Uh, so that's a, let's see. Sixteen. That is a hit. 
splashing it with the holy water, it, it sears with the, this kind of steam coming off of it. Roll 3d6 for damage. Uh, that is a 16. Oh, big money. There we go. Nice. It screeches out. Uh, though it is waterlogged, the holy water still has its radiant potency. Uh, anything else from you, Mr. Big? No, I'm good where I am. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> um, so with that, we're going to go to Fred. Uh, Fred is going to keep trying to hack and slash at this thing. Alrighty. Round two. That's going to be a 17 to hit. That is a hit. And I'm going to... So again, I pull the blade out and then I yell, Psychic Strike again. And, I, and you can see he the blade start to glow as I cleave into him. So I'm going to, uh, that's going to add an additional D6 of damage uh, for one of my abilities, plus my intelligence modifier. So, plus Great Weapon Master. So, nine. Does the does Psychic Strike make all the weapons damage magical, or just the extra damage that you deal? Allow me to read it. Um... <laughs> You could propel your weapons with psionic force. Once on each of your turns, immediately after you hit a target within 30 feet of you with an attack and deal damage to it with a weapon, you can expend one psionic energy die, rolling it and dealing force damage to the target equal to the number rolled. So I guess I'll do that separately. Yes, please do, because it matters. Because your your regular blade is not magical, correct? Correct. Okay, it matters. Uh, all right. So 20 damage regular. Okay. And six damp six force damage. Okay. The uh the the rotting body of the mummy is heavily damaged by the force of your blow. The the force damage fully injured it, but your blade bit into its body, but not. But it, it, the the magical resilience of the mummification process has reduced the damage dealt. Uh, awesome. I am going to hold on. Wait, I want. Uh, nice, nice, Fred. You get him. You cut him. I the uh, psychic. I don't know. Um, psychic strike. Psychic strike. I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use second wind. Okay, to regain hit points. Yeah. Yep. So the psychic energy in my body. You can actually see my veins start to bulge and like glow, as I use my psychic energy to. Um, to heal myself. Cool. Very good. Ted, it is your turn. So Ted, seeing his brother engaged with the beast that attacked him, and I think I'm like, I guess I would have been about here, right? Uh, yep. He he came up at me, and he, and, he, and he glared at me and swiped at my brother. Okay, so I'm going to try to shove him towards my brother, at one with a telekinetic shove. So I try to press him backwards. Uh, I make a strength saving throw, correct? Correct. Uh, uh, DC 15. I get a 13. So I push him towards my brother (laughs) off of the uh, off of the uh, the the stone that he that he laid upon Um, and then I'm going to take uh, a few steps back. Do you want to push him there or there? Uh, Push him there or there? Uh, Right towards Fred. Get him. Get him. (laughs) Thanks, Ted. Oh, wait. I guess I could push him away from you, right? I don't have to push him onto you. Does yeah. pushing trigger an opportunity attack or no? No, it does not. That's fair. No. Okay. I'm and fishing. then uh, and then I'm going to try uh, this this new one. I've never tried this before. Uh, I, I reach into my mind and the ground beside uh, this creature starts to shift and shake and a, and a big hand comes out. And I'm going to cast Maximilian's Earthen Grasp. And he has to make another strength saving throw. Uh, I also get a 13. So this this thing grabs him and restrains him. Uh, this this earthen fist that comes out of the mud and guck. And, and you can kind of see like the hint and the glow in my eyes. It's like matching the, the swirls around this fist. And he takes... Uh, uh, seven bludgeoning damage, and he is restrained. Nice. Okay, so 
Well, that was a really good move because now that I'm restrained, I can't attack anybody with my rotting fists. <laughs> <laughs> um, do is there? How do I break out of this? You can use an action and uh, attempt the save again. Okay, but I don't. I don't roll normal. I have to use an action to try to break out. Correct. Uh, yeah, you have to use an action uh, unless I eventually move it to something else. Okay. In that case, the mummy thrashes and screeches as it tries to break out from the grasp, Ugh, getting an eight. <laughs> so this this fist is like holding around its like rotting corpse, like right in the middle. Yeah, and, and, and it, it's got a good grab. It's like b- yeah. pulling into the bones and the missing- and it's thrashing, trying to escape from the, from the grasp, screeching this horrific like <gasps> gasping screech, um, but it, it cannot get out from the grasp. Um, with that, Mr. Big, it is over to you, sir. All right. Um, just out of curiosity, I, I, have you been keeping track of how many holy water flasks I have left? Uh, you have thrown three so far, by my count. And how many did I have total? Um, I believe in the original, uh, you guys picked up a couple. Uh, you filled the water skin up and you picked up a couple. Uh, I actually think, that by my count, uh, you're fresh out. Well, I planned. Uh-oh. I planned that. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward and then dash to get up on top of the thing, and I'm gonna shoot my firebolt down at cool. him. So because the mummy is restrained by the earth, um, you have advantage on your attack roll. So roll twice and take the highest. Ah, yes. And the highest is a twenty-four. That is a brilliant hit, sir. Give Ooh. me the damage. It's going, uh, boss. Let me... Oh. Nice hit, boss. Let I just me... like saying boss. <laughs> <laughs> let me find my ten-sided die. Two. Not a bad hit. <laughs> Not the best <laughs> one on either. Fire. He's on fire. <laughs> That's way better than your last one, boss. You hit him clean. Yeah. Really pulling your weight, boss. Thanks. I, I, um, <laughs> the the mummy uh, with its waterlogged body, a mummy normally would seem vulnerable to flames, but in this case, the uh, the waterlog because it's so waterlogged, it doesn't have that vulnerability that it would nor- normally possess. Ah, so not uh, no damage at all. Uh, it still takes damage, of course, oh, but normally a, normally a mummy would take double damage. But in, in this case, they, they do not. Ted, did you remember to pack a towel? I got something some here. Maybe an old shirt? Old shirt works. We just <laughs> cool. need to dry off this guy. Can you get in there and dry him off? I, I think I'm doing enough here. All right. Fred, it is your turn. Uh, Even though he's grappled, I'm hesitant to run forward, but I I realize I have to. And I slowly approach the hand holding the mummy and get within five feet and I'm going to attack this mummy. Get him, Fred! Uh, I'm going to try not to hit your earth hand. If I hit your earth hand, does it hurt your real hand? Find out. You do have advantage because the mummy is restrained. Well, that's good because I rolled a one and a 16, uh, so that's going to be a (laughs) 17 to hit. Okay. And I'm going to use... I yell psychic strike and another <laughs> another psychic die is going to be used. Uh so what a what a line. Uh normal normal damage is going to be 18. Okay. And 8 uh force damage. Uh with that the animating tethers uh the the tethers animating the mummy uh are cut by your blade, and it collapses and relaxes with inside the earthen grasp of Ted's spell. Guys, my magic powers, they did it! Psychic strike! Psychic strike. You did it, Fred! You did it! Man, that was so cool! How you guys threw water and fire at him, and I held him there, and he just had to take it? Yeah, good teamwork, you guys. Um, down here... Who knew? Now... (laughs) Uh, I- I- indeed. Under your leadership, Mr. Big. <laughs> Under you, boss. Well done, boss. 
Mm -hmm. Um, here, um, in this chamber, there is beyond what, what you find in this chamber. Um, the, the mummy held in her hands, a, 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 a several prayer beads with another holy symbol and in her eyes as well, just like the other bodies are set several gemstones. Wink. Um, and rolled up in several of the urns here are actually several scrolls um, that uh, that contain some magical spells on them as well. Uh, so as you as you go through the the, the some of them are still dry, um, but down here you find that there is a spell scroll of the remove curse spell and a spell scroll uh, uh, de detailing the um, spiritual weapon spell. Ooh. Well, it's a good thing I didn't get cursed. Although, I mean, I guess either way, there was a scroll here that would have helped. But I can't use these scrolls. I don't know how to cast spells. Either of you guys know how to cast spells? I have an inkling. Am I right. able to use these as well? Um, Because... Technically speaking, the remove curse spell is on the wizard spell list. Ah. Uh, you're just not high enough level to cast it on your own. So if you do try to use the scroll, you'll just need to roll to see if you can pull it off successfully. <laughs> um, and and what about uh, what about Ted? Uh, Ted as well could try to use the scrolls. Um, but uh, the 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 way that I run scrolls is. Anyone, like, as long as you're a spellcaster, like, it's kind of like, if it's the spell, you're high enough at level to cast the spell, and you, um, have it on your spell list for your class, no automatic use. If you have one of the two prerequisites, either you can cast spells, um, if you can cast spells but it's not on your list or you're not high enough level, you gotta make a check. If you're, if you can't cast spells, though, you can't use the scrolls. Uh, boss, okay. I think we could figure it out. It, you, you know, you and me together, we could, we could, we could get these things going. They look pretty valuable. Yeah, and, and they're light, so you know, I'll, I'd like to leave you with your hands free. I will, uh, I will tuck them into my uh, my little carrying case. Good thinking, boss. I'm gonna dry them off too with uh, press digitation. Just try to make sure that sure. they're nice and uh, dry before they go in the in the bag. Ted, now there is another heavy. <laughs> There, there's another heavy stone door here uh, up on this edge of the room. It is of similar construction to the door that you just passed through, but this door is closed. There is no visible hinges, handle, lock, or anything on it, and it bears a, a carved inscription uh, de detailing um, the showing the uh, depicting Saint Vitruvio. Um, who is the patron saint of Drakenheim, who rode on a golden dragon. Um, saint Vitruvio is shown in this, and there is an inscription that reads, The truth of the sacred flame enlightens the mind, mends the body, and fuels the soul. Uh, don't worry, guys, I got this. Uh, is there any possible way to, to like get enough leverage to try to lift the door up? Um, not only... As you saw from the door that you lifted up before, mm -hmm. looking back to the the earlier door, the door actually there's a there is a depression about two inches deep yeah. under the ground that the door slots down in. So there's not like there's nothing to slip your fingers underneath mm. to even try to try to lift it up, and even sliding something under to get leverage would be difficult in this case. Um. My fingers are too big and manly for this task. Ted, what about your your tiny infant-like fingers? <laughs> no, I don't think there's enough leverage here. Am Mr. I big, I'm not even going to ask. It's it's a little out of your weight class. How thick is the other door? The the door that you would have come through would have been approximately 6 inches thick. Mm. I think we'll hold off on my my secret weapon and try and figure out another way to get this open first. Um, are are there any other levers or uh, things that that look like they might move? <laughs> A quick scan of the room, no, but you could spend some time searching around looking for something. Yeah, let's do that. What's the door made of again? It is made of stone. 
I'll I'll check the body, see if it's got anything on it. Uh, should we should we check the room? I do maybe. Have... Mm -hmm. Yeah. All okay. Right. What I'll have each of you do is give me an investigation check. Okay. Eighteen. Four. Uh, twenty-five. Okay. Ooh. Now, what uh, what I would like you to each do is roll me a d6. <laughs> this Four. is the one I'm going to whiff. Uh, six. Three. Okay. You spend about five minutes searching the room, um, going over it, and after after five minutes, Mr. Big, you you and Fred look at each other and they're like, "There's no way. There's there's nothing else here." Like you, you, you are certain that you haven't missed anything. Okay. Yeah. I have, I have an idea, boss. There was the room with the mumbles and the grumbles upstairs, mm. which led in a similar direction to the way we're heading. Now, Ted can tell you, I'm the brains of, of, of the two of us. So sometimes got the I, ideas. I, know, I knows a few things that, that, that people don't always think of. And my thought is, that maybe the thing that opened the door that we came through, there's another thingy in the other room that might open the other door. Well, I, you know, and I, I look forward to having you lead the way to that, uh, that other room. And, and cause I think you may be onto something here. I will lead the way boss. All righty. As you head back down the passage to the, uh, other room, uh, all the bones are, back on top of the sarcophagi. Hmm. Do they have anything left to loot? <laughs> <laughs> the lights are out, but the bones are all back in place. Why, are they just getting up and walking back to their beds? I I have a suspicion. Uh, let me know what you think. This doorway, one, one of these doorways might have been moved by what was upstairs, that, that, that stick we stuck in, remember? Yeah. If we open this next door, we have to move that stick. It might close this door. We should find a way to prop this one open just in case. And I'm going to try to find something like a rock or something to kind of wedge in between where it would normally like fit in the slot. This first uh, door, maybe some bones. <laughs> just grab the what bones. if we pile oh, bones all are so the bodies? <laughs> are, are, are you going to go for the bones, or are you going to because there's a stone sarcophagi and the bones themselves? Whoa! Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, oh, look at these anybody want to help me drag one of these sarcophagi over to the door to hold it open? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> what if we grab the mummy, the the mummy bits? I, I want to see if I can. Uh, a body's not going to stop a no, door. No, the, the the slab. Let's grab some rocks and stuff. Okay. Um, there's a few small rocks and bits of loose rock that are around here. Um, but given the weight and size of that stone door, if it, depending on how hard it slams down, it could pulverize the rock underneath it. Ted, can you grab the other end of this mummy's sarcophagi? You got it, Fred. All right. Can I lift okay. it though? Can I? Can We're gonna I... do our best. I'm gonna do most of the lifting. You're just there to direct me. Okay. Got it. I'll I'll stand back and observe. <laughs> All right. The two of you can both make a strength check to try to lift the the mummy's uh, sarcophagi. Can I? Can I use a combination of my telekinetic shove? <laughs> How much weight can your telekinetic shove lift? Oh, I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't say specific. You can just shove creatures five feet. There's no like how th big this. This is like a solid granite sarcophagi. <laughs> it weighs hundreds of pounds. What what size is it? It's I would consider it a large sized object. Wait, Ted, back away. I'm gonna try something. I'm gonna use. I I put my hand up to my head and my eyes start to glow again. And I'm going to use telekinetic movement. You can move an object or a creature with your mind. As an action, you target one loose object that is large or smaller, or one willing creature. And I can move it 30 feet. Ooh. So I, I focus, 
a psychic brain. And I, I slide the sarcophagi under the door. I'm going to allow this, although technically I don't think it's a loose object. It's loose enough. <laughs> Can we, if we, if we try to push it, do we get any we, movement? We, we wiggle get, it. Yeah, I, 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 you know what? I, we're 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 gonna roll with it. You you are able to push it in the path of the of the door. Guys, I just used my brain. You used your <laughs> whole brain for that. Yeah, all of it. It it was it, it felt weird. Ted, I don't know if it's the same when you cast spells, but it felt weird. My whole brain just like, and, That's the and the, just whoop, and magic. It's mm-hmm. wild. Okay. Um. So putting the sarcophagi in the door, the sarcophagus itself is about two feet off the ground. Um. So when you put it in the path of the door, and then fill, and then in the door, the stone door itself. Um. If if the door is closed, like. It's going to, like, like Mr. Big would be able to get through that opening pretty easily. But Ted and Fred, it's going to be a little bit harder for the two of you to get through that opening once it's through. It harder still or hold the door impossible? Um, not impossible, but certainly the type of thing where, like, you're going to get stuck halfway through and then have to pull yourself out. But they'll also be able to get their hands under it. Wait, yeah. there was oil. yes. In the room upstairs, if we oil up our bodies, we can squeeze through any and small blaze like a torch space. on the other side. Yeah, flammable oil sounds good to me. Yep. <laughs> Brilliant, Ted. Always just finishing. You're always finishing my uh, I'll, sandwiches. Least, I, I'll be able to see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boss. Does it sound like a plan? Oh, absolutely. This is like a just in case, you know, we we may not have to work with sarcophagus squeezing. We, you know, it might, everything might just work out. I might just be able to squeeze through, but if not, oil me up. Tad, I'm looking at you. So you place the sarcophagus under the door. uh, And then are you going to head back upstairs? Is that the plan? Yeah. 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 Okay. Alrighty. So you place the, placing it under the door, you head right back up the stairs. Uh, you're back in the the um, the circular room that you were in before. Um, so there, as you know now, there's the there's this passage here which leads to where you heard the cackling, mm-hmm. and another passage up this way through on the other side of the the circular room that you did not uh, go in yet. Which one do you think? Now this room is pretty much over top of where the door was. Yeah. Yeah. This one here. Yeah. So Yeah, I think we probably do have to go that way. Um, I'm wondering, though, if we can take a quick peek down this one just to see if there's anything else there we should know about first. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I need some more holy water anyways. Sounds good, boss. Okay. So heading up that way, there is another circular chamber identical to the first one that you just came from with another identical circular um, uh, pillar three feet high, again, with the slot in the in the top of it. There is a staircase leading down and to the north, and the room ends in a short passageway before opening to, before another door is in the path there. I, can I ask a quick question? Up on the surface, was there another statue that we saw? Did we see another statue? There, there were three statues in the chapel itself. Do I remember if they were holding poles? Um, you did not go inside and look at them. <laughs> uh, where did, are but, these stairs? But Walt going? did. Walt did. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see if Walt remembers. Roll a d6. <laughs> <laughs> Four. That uh... the statue the the center uh, statue was a statue of uh, um there there were three statues in the chamber two of women and one of men and uh, one of a man and um though a quick recollection doesn't recall any of them holding a rod 
Okay. At least one of construction, or, or they might have been holding objects like swords, but they they were all of marble construction, not of anything of silver. Nothing that stood out. Okay. As I go into this room here, is the circular, is it the same? Does it have like a center Yes, it hole? does. All right. We need another silver rod or the same silver rod. Are these stairs going up or down? They're going down. Hmm. Could we hold? And you can see us as you go down the stairs. It is dark down there. Oh, man. Oh, goodness. Why don't they put torches in these places? I mean, the people who tend to the bodies need to be able to see. Ugh. Design. (laughs) Ted, when we build our shop, we got to make sure that there's lighting in there. You know, you don't want people going into the place. People need to know what they're buying. Right? Mm -hmm. You got to see it noise coming from this direction um make a perception check sure uh 19 yes you can hear that there there's creatures arguing over something on on, on the other side um you hear one voice saying no, he called me fat. No, I'm not. You're, you're, there's nothing to you. You're just hot air. These sound like the same ones we heard in front of the other door. Yeah. They can teleport. <laughs> so Obviously. I, I'm I'm guessing we should probably go try to deal with those guys. Um, and, you know, I again, I don't want to steal anyone's glory here. I, I think you guys have done a, a, an excellent job leading the way, so... <laughs> so so like so I mean we, you want us to go in there? I'll be right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Always have our backs, right, boss? All right. Ted, what do you think? Put our brains together. Can you push your head against my head? Mm. What do you think? I think you should go first. You're the big strong one. You know, I was thinking it too. I just hoped you wouldn't say it, but that's what happens when we brain push, so let's go. Uh, I walk up to the door and I try to creak it open slowly. Um, as the door creaks open, there is a small um, yelp um, and you hear several voices go, quick, stop, hide. I, uh, I hide. <laughs> you clipped. <laughs> I, I try to peek. I, I like push the door a little bit more and I peek through. Okay. Um, peeking through the door, this is what you see. I will just read that. And that. As you peek through the door, you see a long vaulted chamber uh, beyond. It extends um, all the way to the south where you can actually see a spiral staircase uh, below. Um, So the which is down yeah. Um, This room um, this is a crypt. There are urns, clay pots, and painted vases kept in hundreds of alcoves cut into the walls. There are smaller niches about uh, uh, that um, are also cut into the pillars that are holding up the vaulted ceiling. Um, and several of the pillars hold human skulls that have candles on top of them that are half melted, like cr- almost like a crown. The vaulted ceiling's 10 feet up, um, and there are iron chandeliers and bronze candelabras set throughout the entire chamber. Um, and there's many candles in this room, but they're flickering in colors of purple, green, uh, octarine, blue, and, uh, and uh, other unnatural flame colors. Not all of the candles in here are lit. And there's actually you, the sound of a almost a peculiar sweeping, crumbling breeze, like a dust devil getting kicked up in this room. And you actually see these, these dusty forms 
of what looked like small imp-like creatures with wings and bodies made of dust and smoke and one of glowing cinders and they're sweeping up trying to hide themselves in the rooftops but you see them uh you see them as they hide um and the um the as the breeze kicks through this chamber the candlelight shudders uh erratically um you can see that this chamber is connected to the other door that you saw earlier as well as the staircase back up to the chapel and the dripping water is flowing down from up above uh as, as well in the in this otherwise dry and dusty room uh the creatures um that uh, their bodies made of dust, dust, ash, and cinders themselves um, almost hide up behind the pillars, and you hear one of their voices um, uh, call out in, the, in this shrill tone, and it says, "Stop there, meatbag!" And another one says, "You're trespassing!" And uh, um, and a, a third one says, "Give us all your gems." Oh, um, Ted. <laughs> Do you speak dust? <laughs> I might. I need you in here. Um, it's, uh, it's flaky. <clears throat> Hello, welcome to Fred and Ted's Odds Ends and Wheels, where we make the world go round. Um, and one another voice says, "That's stupid. The world's not round. Everyone knows it's a cylinder." And another says, "It's not a cylinder. It's a giant, ins- inconspicuous stack of plates." And a third one says, no, it's just completely flat and it goes on forever. No, I heard there was an ice sheet surrounding it. Yeah, and the, 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 the several voices say, uh, and they, they immediately break into arguing and quibbling with each other. We all know that the Earth is a 12-sided die rolling through the universe, <laughs> and we make it go round with wheels. That mm. It's the... T- Ted... You're better at talking than I am. I need need your sales pitch. I'm going to go into your mind and without saying anything, look for a rod. The the, the creatures say, are there more of you back there? You're trespassing on our home. We we're squatting in this place fair and square. We are looking for a rod. A rod. It's long and silver. It has a button on one end, and that will leave if you just give us. Is there one here? The the, the one points to one of the the the, the candlestick, the candelabras, uh, knocks the candles off, pulls the rod up, and it says, and flutters in the air with it, and says, "Here, you can stick this up your butt." That would hurt a lot. <laughs> so. Is that the rod? If you want it, you better have some gems, flesh bag. They want gems. Is it does this look like a like the right rod or is, no? no? The thing just picked up a, a, a candlestick and is offering it to you. I <laughs> for think money. I, I toss the candlestick back behind me towards Ted and Mister Big, and they I'm did, like, they didn't give it to you. Oh. <laughs> They're holding it. They're like, and it says, "Yeah, if you want this, it'll cost you gems." <laughs> Is there I, anywhere that there's the rod? Can you see the I, rod? I start looking around the room. I, I kind of take one more. I step in a little bit cautiously, and I'm just like, "That's one sounds- of the ones that that is made of a cloud of cinders." Uh, sa- uh, says, hey, Ashley, he's scoping up all of our belongings. This ash, this dust, this dirt, it belongs to us. You can't have any of it. I am not touching anything. I just glance around the room. Do I see one, it? one of the other floating impish creatures, its body entirely made of dust, says to you, you're stirring up all my hard spread dust. Every foot you take. Look at those footsteps that you've put. That dust, I made that dust with my own two wings. It's not even going to breathe. I'm just standing here and I'm just going to look around the room. Um, Looking around the room, there are several, there are many urns, bones and skulls in here. But there is nothing resembling a silver rod, at least from the vantage point that you're looking at right now. I put I put my hands up, and I just slowly start to back out of the room. Ah! You're not going anywhere, flesh bag. 
You've walked in the chamber, says the, the one whose body is, is made of smoke. You gotta pay us. You got any gems? Here's the thing. My gems are in the room back there with the holy water. And I need to go get them to pay you. Make a persuasion check. Good, good, good. Eleven. That sounds logical. <laughs> I I slowly back out, and as I back out with my hands up, I just grab the doorknob and slowly close the door. You hear the voice go behind, I wonder what kind of gems he's got. They better be big ones. Uh, Do you think he wants the rod? Yeah, but we're going to charge him a big price for it. Wait, they have the rod? <laughs> I don't think they have the yeah, another rod. They have that, a rod. <laughs> no, Ted's, yeah. Fred's getting and, confused and again. One, oh, one, of them say, the... one of the other voices says, who would have thought that a worthless hunk of metal would have been worth so much to those flesh bags? Okay, guys, we need to be quiet about this because they think we're going to get gems to pay them, but we need to very quickly get that rod, put it in here, turn it, and get back to the basement before these dust creatures figure out we're not paying them gems. Can we lock these doors? You, um, you could probably set a crossbar or bar them, but they don't lock. And so we we the we didn't actually see it in there. They're talking about it as if they have it, but they don't. We, we haven't seen it. I think they're talking about the candelabras if it's the rod we're looking for. Uh, but the only rod that actually resembles what we're looking for is the one we use in the other uh, dot uh, turn thingy. We might have to reuse the rod, boss. What do you think? Maybe we should take a peek down these stairs first before we lead them back to where the other rod is. If they come in, I don't want them to steal the one we've already got. We need this rod. This is our only rod right now. Well, it's in the other room, but... That's what I mean. If they if they come after us, they're going to come this way. So let's go take a peek downstairs. Or, you know, you, you go take a peek downstairs and I'll follow <laughs> close behind you. Okay, um, taking a peek down. I'm gonna stairs. retrieve a new uh, a new torch as well. So I'm gonna light up a new torch and uh, head down the uh, down the steps. Okay, well you um, head down the steps, um, and let me just reveal reveal what you see. No, that's conceal, not reveal. <laughs> I love uh, uh, roll twenty. Always gets the, these tools mixed up. Okay, so I, I place your tokens yes. there. Roll twenty. Um, does. A, as you head down the stairs, there is a stone door of similar construction to the ones that you've encountered pre previously. Again, it, it 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 is set into the floor. This is not a roughly hewn passage either. In this uh, in this chamber uh, here, there's an inscription on the door reads um, the that says. The revered dead shall sleep eternal so long as the sacred flame burns. Um, and the uh, the the inscription here has uh, the 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 image of knowing just with layman's knowledge of the faith of the sacred fire. Um, they believe in the faith of the sacred fire that um, everyone who dies goes to the shadowlands, and that in the shadowlands, if you are faithful you will be able to see the light of the sacred fire, which will guide you to the place where dawn breaks over the Shadowlands. This, the mural on the inscription here is depicting that metaphorically, showing a deceased spirit walking through the Shadowlands, but following through that, that basically hellscape to a place where dawn will rise, where they can join with the sacred fire. Okay, so obviously we're going to have to go back, get the silver rod, and use it in this other uh, iron post to get this door open. Yeah, so, boss, it looks like it. This door ain't, ain't moving. So yeah, let's do that. Sounds good, boss. Fred, okay. do you, Fred, do you want to watch this door? <laughs> do you want me to stay here and watch this door? 
Ted, are you gonna are you gonna it, leave? I'm is I'm it, still it, mentally. Okay. I'll do another. Yeah, yeah, let's let's split up. We'll cover more ground that way. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should probably stick together. I, this door isn't going to leave without us, and so why don't we? You know, you wanna, you, you call it. Boss. I want to be able good, to good thinking, okay. boss. So, Keep an, look so out for you guys. One of you is going to go back, disengage the winch in the other room, correct? And we're all going to go. Oh, okay. So you all go back. Who's going to remove the rod? Me. Fred. Okay. okay. So Fred, it with the button pressed, it doesn't budge. But pressing the button, it releases. And as soon as you actually release the button, you feel the winch resetting. And so as you pull it out, it unwinds and you hear this crash uh, resounding from down, down below. I sure hope that mummy's okay. <laughs> um, the rod in hand, you return to the pre- the other winch room. Uh, as before, and are able to use the same method to raise the door, to raise the door. And again, it turns and you can actually hear the creaking of the door rising up down the stairs as you pull it up. And as you do, you can see the candlelight spill out into the landing at the base of the stairs. Suggest this time that if we see some things like dead lying on sarcophagi surrounded by candles, we think before we grab... Uh, but boss, I thought we were here to loot. I thought that was the whole purpose of the mission. Yeah, we, okay. we're gonna we're gonna loot. We're just gonna loot smart. I want you to know that when I tell you guys this, I did not plan. I did not consider your characters when I planned this. Just just to let you know. <laughs> okay. Wait, why? Why? What? Okay. the The room opens into a large circular chamber um, that is actually uh, kind of donut shaped, and. Mm. It, uh, yeah, mm, oh, donuts. donuts. Um, <laughs> this room is a finished chamber. Perhaps it is much newer than the than the than the old roughly hewn crypts below. It certainly looks to be the case. Here are six are are, are interred six skeletons, just uh, in a similar fashion to before. Uh, to before, they are laid to rest upon stone sarcophagi surrounded by lit candles. Several of them have various trinkets, but the northernmost one has a great is holding in his two hands a great sword that is glowing with a prismatic light. Boss. Oh man, I, boss. <laughs> uh you know, be my guest. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna We're gonna break all the rules. <laughs> Don't gonna, worry. Stand Don't back worry. here in the shadows and sort of scope everything out, and uh, you know, I'll I'll help out if the predictable happens. Unlike <laughs> my brother Ted, who gets surprised when dead people wake up, I am prepared, and I stand. I climb up onto this uh, sarcophagus with a leg on either side of the body. Wait, Fred. Yeah. Um, what? Also, I'll, I'll just note at the at the south, um, there is another doorway of similar uh, much that is almost identical to the doorway that you saw in the other crypt uh of w- that had the mummy in it um and so it um this is where we want to be i have a feeling mm-hmm. and this uh, and, is- one, uh, and once again it it also says the the um the this it its inscription actually said uh, um reads uh, upon this door itself Where's my note here? Uh, um, it says to trust others is never weakness no it is strength Ted I trust you Fred I trust you um, <laughs> we got this <laughs> I trust myself Monty, what's Mr. in the middle Bing, of the room? We trust you two with our lives. Um, in the middle of the room, um, the room is donut shaped. So the the um, this is a solid wall that is holding up the rest of the chamber, uh, that is vaulted uh, twelve feet above you. All right. So it did say, I I've been I've been reading a lot since the amulet gave me these powers, and it did say that uh, the. Rev- Revered dead shall sleep eternal so long as the sacred flame burns. 
is there anything on here that can stay on fire? We, the candles. We, we put the, it on the, fire, the, and the, maybe they'll at stay the candles, asleep. They don't. Uh, the the candles haven't been consumed. So, however long these have been down here, the candles um, haven't melted away. They've remained lit. Mm. So as long as the candles don't go out, we're fine. So nobody breathe on the candles. Nobody step on them or kick them or pick did, them up. Did, did you breathe on the candles last time this happened, though? Or did they just go out as soon as you crossed the... I mean, I assume Ted kind of just let a... You, wait, as soon as you crossed from archaeologist to grave robber, you, you really... All the candles just suddenly... <laughs> Is there anything else in the room that we could set on fire, like make a little bonfire out of with the uh, oil we're there, carrying? There is um, in in the room. There are bits of wood and ash, so that you could create a small flame with it. Why don't we do that? Just to just to have something. I'm gonna make a campfire. Yeah, I start I'm, building a okay. campfire. As yeah, you I'm stand still perched over, the, over body. the body, waiting, and I'm like, all right, you just tell me when. Just tell me when. <laughs> all of you can roll a d6. Uh, four. Four. Six. Okay. Um, you just hear the small echo of a voice that comes from up above. I wonder when those meat bags are coming back. I can't wait to get those gems. <laughs> Nobody say anything about the gems. How's our fire coming? I'm going to also light it. Can I light a piece of of like uh, of like tinder or wood from the uh from one of the candles uh yes you can gotta keep that uh sacred flame they're really they really love their flame uh, how sacred does their fire feel does it feel pretty sacred i it feels divine down here boss let's, you let's, getting let's pour a little of that oil that we got onto it but being careful of course not to let it follow but back up into the thing and set my eyebrows on fire okay <laughs> very carefully Pouring the oil on the corpse of the... Uh, no, on, no the, on, the, the little, on the little bonfire. Oh, on the bonfire. Okay. You pour the oil on the bonfire and it, it just... There's kind of that moment of like, whoosh! <laughs> uh, and, and it burns quite brightly. Um, and you notice that after that fire has been set, that the flame doesn't appear to be consuming what you poured it on. Hmm. All right, let's make our move. Um, oh, can I like hide in the shadows before we do this? Uh, yeah, where do you want to hide? Um, if there's room in the doorway, I'll just duck back there just so I can sort of sneak attack if, uh, if uh, you know, the predictable happens. <laughs> Ted, Ted, you got my back? All right, all right. Nothing's going to go wrong, baby, child, little, young Ted. Don't worry. New sword for big bro. Yeah. And I'm going to take my old sword, and in an, an attempt at Indiana Jonesing it, I'm going to pull the new sword away and put my and like it's not even that good though. Like I rip it off of his arm and I clang my sword down and like just tuck it all you know back what? in. Make a slate of hand check. Ooh I got a five. So graceful. Um, you as you pull the sword away. The arm comes off with it. <laughs> I quickly a- rip the arm off and and like set it back down and try to piece it together like a puzzle, and I back away. By the time you do, there is a whoosh noise, and oh, no. all the candles go out in the in in the chamber. The fire that you created remains lit, um, lighting the room, but the candles go out, and the bones begin to stir roll for initiative but what about uh, my sword what did i get you now have a magic great sword oh cool that's it's just magical <laughs> yeah it's a plus one great sword Ooh, plus one magic great sword okay, let I got me, a 14 uh, i got an 11 i got a big old six I've really been uh swinging and missing on the initiative Plus I'm just one. always surprised at what's happening. <laughs> Even though we knew yeah. that we we knew that the bones would get up. <laughs> we knew. <laughs> Still I'm like, whoa, they it happened again. I thought I had it this time. I thought I would be quick and you were nimble. so close. Fred. I know. I know, Ted. <laughs> Boss, yeah. the skeletons are coming alive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Let's just deal with it, I guess. <laughs> 
So, I'll okay. Still have. So, uh, fortunately, uh, Mr. Big, you are the first to act. Woo. Um, I think so. I'm going to, I'm going to try and, uh, use my, um, I'm going to use the short sword this time so that I can, I can try to do uh, sneak attack damage too. Mm -hmm. Um, so I will go after this guy here. Cool. Um, as you do, you're coming out of hiding. So yeah. give me a stealth check to maintain your advantage. Sure. Uh, big money, big money. 17. Awesome. Uh, because you're coming out of hiding to attack, I'm going to let you attack with advantage, which will let you sneak attack. So you spring out. And that is... Da, 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 da. Hold on. Uh, 24. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> nice. Very good. Um, the 24 is a hit. Um... And so you'll be able to apply your sneak attack damage as well to uh, as, as well to this. Oh, so that's three d six plus four, uh, and that is thirteen. Um, so a as you uh, uh, push your your short sword into into the skeleton, um, you kind of push out the central vertebra of its neck, and just like a, a puppet with the strings cut, it just collapses right to the ground. Cool. Nice. Nice, boss. Fred, you're up. Uh, shocked and surprised at my failure of being able to not wake up the skeletons, I immediately take my new glowing sword, and I'm like, psychic sword! And I attack the skeleton. Uh, getting getting a four to hit. That is a miss, I'm yeah. afraid. Yeah. Pretty, not a, not a good good omen for this new uh, new blade. Ah, uh, this sword is weighted different. Sorry, guys, I don't know how to handle this blade. It's more heavy on the top than it is on the bottom. I'm trying to justify it as the skeletons running towards me. Yeah, the the skeletons run towards you and screeching. The three of them attack, getting a 16, a 17, and a 19 to hit. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> Did those all hit? Yeah. That's, that sounds bad. Oh, my God. I rolled max damage on all the attacks. Uh, on that's all 20, of... Yeah, that's 24 points of damage. Uh, I'm down. No! <laughs> Fred! <laughs> uh, guys, the sword idea has got us to... Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and you get mauled by these... <laughs> uh, and Ted, you also uh, get mauled. Oh. Um, on the other hand, I get a 9 and a 19 to hit you. The 19 hits. That'll be uh, 7 damage. Ooh. With that, Ted, it is your turn. Okay. Um, I, I look around. I'm kind of surrounded right now, aren't I? In, uh, you're not quite so well you're going to be very soon <laughs> okay um i reach into my mind and i cast one of my psionic spells the arms of hadar and they these tentacle like um almost like tendrils of energy reach out and lash at these creatures everything within 10 feet of me is mr big within 10 feet of me can i move just a little bit so he doesn't uh, yeah, get... Yeah, if you move a bit to the left, yeah, you'll that that will... Okay. Yeah. And um, my guess is that these types of creatures are pretty resilient to necrotic damage. Uh, I could be wrong. I'm going with my uh, intuition on the undead. So I'm going to use transmuted spell to change the type to cold damage. Okay. Alrighty, and you're you're casting this with as a with, as a first uh, level just spell like a or first a level, level, just a first level spell. Okay, uh, so I have to make strength saving throws. Please and thank you. I get a nine and an eight. Woo! And so uh, I believe they take um two d six. Ooh, eleven cold damage. Uh, so that expending. Actually uh, the cold damage actually freezes their bones. They seize up and crumple to the floor. And then awesome. I yell, Fred, no! And uh, I'm Dad, going that was to, great. I, I'm going to reach 
uh, into uh, Fred's body with my te- telekinetic shove and try to pull him away from the the pull horde. Pull his of, body away? Yeah, okay. the, from the monsters. I'm going to try to pull his uh, body. Yep. And uh, so he, I he, pull back he five He cannot feet. resist, so yeah. Because <laughs> he is unconscious. Well, just yeah. sliding across the ground towards you. Yep. Uh, we go to the top of the round with Mr. Big. I can't help but notice that I am now closer to them than anyone else. Um, <laughs> um, let me ask you a question. Does color spray work on undead? Um, give me an arcana check. Sure. Twenty. Um. Yes, it does. Okay, then. Um, before they can come towards me, I'm going to I'm going to blind them. Nice. OK. Uh, casting color spray on each. Yes. Cool. So you need to roll 6d10. And that is how many hit points worth of creatures are blinded with no saving uh, throw. Let me make sure I've got the right dice for this. Uh... The <laughs> This will be much safer. We can just leave. We can just walk away. They won't know. Okay, so that's 20. Um, 37. Uh, that is actually enough to blind all three of them. Yeah! <laughs> uh, so Amazing. all three are blinded. The The dazzling color uh, um, d- distorting their undead senses for, for a moment. Um, Fred, anything else, Mr. Big? Um, I'm, I'm going to just back up a little bit. <laughs> All righty. Uh, Fred, I need a death saving throw, my friend. Yep. It's going to, it's going to be a one. That is two failed death saves. <laughs> no, Fred. No, I can see the life force draining from him. My eyes are not glowing anymore. Yeah. And I, I hold it out. And I'm like, sell the magic sword, Ted. <laughs> Sell the magic sword. Uh, Ted, it is your turn. Um, so I know we kind of dove into this. Maybe I didn't check my backpack, but do I or Fred have any healing potions other than the ones Mr. Big found? Uh, yes, all, all of you uh, did have healing potions. I thought we rolled that off camera. Oh, okay, yeah. So <laughs> I, I'm going to run over and I'm going to grab a, a, a drink out of uh, Fred's uh, pouch and, and pour it down his, his throat. Okay. Fred, 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 re- you regain ten hit points. Oh, actually, I'm gonna pull him towards me again. I'm just gonna actually okay. drag his body across the <laughs> the cold stone floor, and then uh, and then uh, administer the healing potion. Oh, I'm awake. I had a horrible nightmare. There were there were skeletons. You're living it again. Oh Get god, <laughs> life is a nightmare. Uh, and that's my turn. Okay, Mr. Big, we go back to you, sir. Um, I'm going to just shoot one of them with a firebolt. Um, no reason to get close. <laughs> oh, actually, sorry. I, I should have narrated. The, the skeletons do stumble forward. Oh. Um, and they, they I skipped their turn by mistake. They blindly, they, they slash at the air um, and and try to, like, find a target. But they, they, they're not smart enough to figure out where you guys are. Actually, if I use my, if I use the, the hand crossbow, I can probably get... Um, am I am I correct that I can get sneak attack damage on that? Yes, because they're blinded till. Uh, uh, um, well, let me they, use that instead of the yeah. fire, um, and hope that the nice. crossbow bolt actually works. Yeah. <laughs> oh, do I have advantage on this? Yes, because a creature who cannot see you, you have advantage on attack rolls against them. So that's really nice. that's really fortunate. Then then I get a sixteen. <laughs> and actually, I'm sorry. A uh, a. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I sorry, twenty two. It's a hit. Nice. So that Blind is. And shoot. Yes. And that's going to be thirteen again. Um, you shoot the head off the skeleton with the crossbow bolt. It's just like a quick thunk thunk, and it it rolls off like a perfect dead eye shot. Ah, <laughs> oh, boss, what a hero you are! <laughs> just save our lives. Thanks. Fred, oh. you have awoken from a unconsciousness Ugh. into an uh, into a horrible scenario with two skeletons lingering over you. All right, I got the hang of the sword now, Ted. I'm good to go. You got God. this. 
I, I run up and I'm going to I'm gonna just go right back into it and I'm gonna swing at this uh, skeleton here. Alrighty. Critting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So the bones just go flying everywhere. Psychic um, strike, and I don't even use my psychic yeah. abilities, but he he, he explodes, <laughs> and just the bone goes flying everywhere. I scream and charge at the next skeleton, and because yeah. of my great weapon master, I'm gonna dish out to him as well, getting a six to hit. A miss, I'm afraid. Still, still don't got it. Still not getting the hang of this. Did you roll with an advantage? Because he was blinded? Oh, no, is I he didn't blinded? roll with advantage. The, the blinded is over. Oh, oh darn. Uh. Yeah. The skeleton screeches back at you, only getting a 10 to hit. Um, Block. So, Ted, bring it back on in. Uh, I'm going to fire a, uh, a firebolt at this, uh, this undead creature attacking my brother for a, a 17 to hit. Nicely done. For 10 damage. And as it clambers to the ground um, with Fred gasping uh, from his near-death experience, uh, the chamber goes quiet once more. Oh, guys, I got a new sword. (laughs) (laughs) I hope it was worth it. Single Um, focus. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. Well, um, having thoroughly explored these chambers, that is where we will uh, wrap things up for this evening at 8.56 p.m. Uh, But what a way to end the night with uh, some critical strikes, a near-death experience, and some very foolish grave robbers. (laughs) I don't know what you're talking about. We're we're alive. We're all still here. Start picking up the remnants, like the holy symbols. Just start immediately ripping them off the All All according to plan. (laughs) You know, so... We actually had some really smart teamwork considering yeah. that we're, I mean, at least two of us are bumbling idiots, but <laughs> we one pulled of us it will off. never admit that that's the case, <laughs> I guess. Uh, but no, good, good job, guys. Yeah, it was wonderful, team. wonderful. Yeah, uh, fantastic little, little run uh, so Thank far. So I wonder what so our fun. heroes will encounter next week. <laughs> Um, that is that is all for us for this for this evening. Uh, we will be back at it next week with Matt uh, to finish yes. up uh, the, this little little adventure. So be sure to join us then. In the meantime, a wonderful thank you from the bottom of my heart to Matt, Joe, and Kelly for playing with us tonight. Thank you. We've been a great DM. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, um, Matt, where can folks find uh, all, all your great stuff? Uh, just one last reminder for those that might have missed it. Anywhere uh, that uh, books are sold, basically. So, you know, your local independent bookstore or, uh, you know, one of those online guys. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Kelly, do you want to take us on out? Uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you to Kyle, who is our tech guy who keeps everything running behind the scenes. Uh, he was hanging out in chat today, I believe. Um I miss I miss his thumb, and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. We, we had a beautiful weekend here in Toronto, and uh, we set up the chairs in the backyard. We managed managed to come over for a brew. I got to see. Uh, I haven't seen him in months. It was it was lovely. Uh, so, Matt, uh, he's doing well. In case you don't know, Matt, we do have another member of our team, Kyle. He uh, every at the end of every episode, back when we played live, he would stick his thumbs up into screen just to, as like <laughs> nobody's ever seen his face. Maybe depends where you look, but we all miss Kyle dearly. And thank you very much for still being a part of this. And we love you. Um, Also, we have a phenomenal discord community that is exclusive for our patrons. If you are enjoying our work, make sure to join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash dungeon underscore dudes. Join our Discord where you can join us for monthly writer's rooms uh, to help us come up with scripts. You can join monthly Q&As and submit questions for those. And there's a lot of chat right now about the Drakenheim Kickstarter. Dungeons of Drakenheim is coming to Kickstarter in June. And you can join the mailing list at drakenheim.com to be up to date on all of the information involving that. As always, Kelly and I post new videos every Thursday on our YouTube channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We got a great video this week, long requested topic on how to run D&D for large groups. Though we have a small intimate party with our, our live streams, normally Kelly and I have run for some big groups of six, seven, eight, 
and even more once in a while. So we got our best advice if you got a if you got a real party uh, a, 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 in in happening in your D and D game. So check that out. Uh, that's going to be dropping this this Thursday. And be sure to join us live next Tuesday when we record the campaign live on Twitch. We will be joined again by our wonderful guest, Matt Ruff, and that will be from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern time at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. And you can catch all the previous episodes of our show on our YouTube channel as well. Thank you all so much for watching, and we will see you next week back in the ruins of Drakenheim. <laughs>